The message we got from the Fed was very much an all clear. The markets responded in kind. This market is behaving in a way that thinks that rate cuts are absolutely imminent and that we're going to have this Goldilocks scenario. And I don't currently see that. A lot of the drivers for higher rates haven't left the market. There is some skepticism around how much is the Fed ultimately going to cut. Whether it comes to the Fed's forecast being realized or the market expectations being realized, I think the truth in the end will lie somewhere in between. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Key. Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. What a difference a month makes. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your Monday morning price action looks like this. Equities just about positive by 0.2% on the S&P. Here's the big call to kick off a trading week. David Costin at Goldman Sachs with a new, yes, a new price target on the S&P for next year. That price target is 5,100. The old one is about a month old. It was 4,700. Here's the quote from the team over at Goldman. Equities were already pricing positive economic activity, but Lisa now reflect an even more robust outlook. And the reason why it is is because drum roll, Jay Powell came out and basically said that we're talking about rate cuts, but maybe they're not talking about rate cuts. If you listen to John Williams over at the New York Fed, maybe that's premature to talk about it if you listen to Austin Goolsby. The point is, everyone heard what Jay Powell had to say, and they're going to run with it because this is a dovish Fed that is a bias to cut. That pushback got absolutely steamrolled again by Williams and maybe by Goolsby again this morning. Here's a quote from Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson. Yes, really. He says this. This is a bullish outcome for stocks. Even the bearish Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley is joining in. How credible is that pushback on Friday and again over the weekend? Well, I think the market has voted and the vote had said that it wasn't very credible at all because, frankly, it was just the Fed chair basically saying the quiet part out loud when everybody else was saying, please, don't let financial conditions ease too much. And he's saying, let her rip. I mean, essentially, he had a chance to push back. He didn't. He had a chance to say that financial conditions concerned him. He didn't. He had a chance to say a whole host of things that he did not do, and that's what spoke volumes. Just to clarify, are we talking about rate cuts or not? If you parse through the words, some members brought up rate cuts, but they're not engaged in a deep conversation where they're saying, are we going to cut in March and exactly how much? To me, it seems like they are absolutely thinking about it. It's just a question of whether it's the main tenor of discussion. These are nuances. People heard what they, what they needed to hear. Prepare yourself. We have more Fed speak <laughs> through the week. I'm sure you're really excited. We've had ECB pushback as well. The pushback is only as credible as the data behind it. And the data behind the pushback in the ECB it ain't there. The EFO index, German business confidence was pretty weak. European economy, it's pretty weak. The PMIs on Friday, pretty dreadful. Which is the reason why the market rejected that too and why the pushback over at the ECB and frankly even the Bank of England didn't get as much attention as J.J. Powell and what he had to say. And this is what's notable to me. The strength is in the economic outlook for the United States and yet the most dovish tone is from the Federal Reserve of the United States. The outlook does not look good for the ECB in the Euro region, and yet they're trying to maintain a hawkish tone, and it's not necessarily gaining the credibility. So what do you do? Well, I can tell you what people have been doing. They've been buying stocks. Equities on a seven-week winning streak on the S&P 500. Equities this morning, the scores look like this, up by 0.2% on the S&P. The Euro a little stronger, 109.10 on the Euro against the dollar after having a little look at 110 going into the weekend. And in the bond market, yields down by another basis point just a little bit lower to 389.78. Lisa, what a turnaround in the bond market. It's just shocking to think that we've come down more than a percentage point from the October high. What we're looking at this week, Tuesday, we've got a Bank of Japan rate decision. I think it's going to be interesting because people were thinking this is the time for them to drum roll exit negative interest rates. They still have negative interest rates. And then people said, well, the economic data wasn't good enough for them to do that. We've already seen people reprice a bit stronger uh, yen versus the dollar. But really, uh, still that feeling that they're not going to move away that quickly is embedded. Wednesday, another auction. They don't matter until they do. $13 billion of 20-year notes coming at a time when you've seen this dramatic repricing, more than a percentage point decline in that 20-year note. What happens if there's weak demand? What happens if people start worrying about the deficit? Or is that basically off the table? Because Guess suddenly we're talking about the into Fed. the studio on Wednesday. TK's making an appearance. For I'm the told. auctions? Just in for one single day this week. I have no idea if it's the auctions or not, but it, it will be Wednesday. So that will make sure to get his take on the auctions. And Friday, this actually is going to be interesting. Again, it's only as credible as the data behind it. I think that that's a really good comment of yours. U.S. November personal income and spending comes out, as well as core PCE deflator. Does it keep coming down? If it doesn't, 
Does that challenge this idea that the Fed is as dovish as Jay Powell? Feels like week over. Let's get to it. Year over. Steve Chevron joins us around the table, head of multi-asset at Federated. Um, Steve, good morning to good you. Morning. What a difference a month makes. Are you more bullish now than you were a month ago? This is, 2023 was a year where, despite having concerns economically, we held our nose and we bought. Um, we thought the, the consensus early in the year was too bearish for an early year recession and then a second half recovery and we bought equities. And then we were too underweight growth and you got to sell off in the summer and we bought equities. And, and, and I don't think we were necessarily more prescient than anyone else, but it worked. Um, and I think what you're seeing with these price targets moving up is earnings have inflected positively, right? We, we saw that. We went to you know year-over-year -year earnings growth. You could forecast earnings growth in 24. You, you could feel decently good about that, but you couldn't get to the idea that you'd get any multiple expansion. But if the Fed really is, and we'll call it thinking about thinking about cuts, to throw back an old term, um, then you can start to think about, well, maybe you do get a little bit of multiple expansion. And I think that's why you're seeing so many strategists up their, up their forecast for next year, because there's a multiple expansion component they didn't have before. We've got broader participation, small caps already starting to rip, mm -hmm. financials, the bank's looking good as well. Do you think that improving breadth is a head fake or the real deal? How do you know? I, I think that's something you watch. I, I think as you go through next year, right, really the argument here still is, if, if, it's, if it's still out there, is this a, a final gasp of, of, of the last rally before you know, Armageddon, which is not our view? Or is this the beginning of something that's a little bit more sustainable? It, it, it's going to be more sustainable if it's broadening out. If smalls are performing, if financials are performing, if transports are performing, if discretionary is leading, those are signs that you've got a sustainable move, which is why I think the last month or so has been encouraging because it's the first time you've seen that this year. I just want to note that there have been six other times that the, the market has embraced this idea of yeah. some dovishness and then gotten some cold water dashed on it mm -hmm. because of economic data that came out stronger than expected. How offsides is this market going to be if we do get some sort of reacceleration in inflation? Well, I, I think it depends on how much, right? So if we're talking about an extended pause, you know, pauses historically are the best environments for equities, much better than when the Fed's cutting. So if you have upside surprises to inflation that would react, if, if, the, if this Fed, after that press conference, had to go back and hike, then yeah, that, that would be really bad. But if it's strong enough data just to keep them on hold, frankly, that may be better than cuts, because they usually cut for a reason. And so cuts would suggest that you see continued economic softening. If it's stable and they're on pause, that could be just fine for equity markets. I think the bond market is where you might have some issues because that's kind of gotten ahead of itself. That's where I wanted to go. Do you expect the rally to continue in tandem with bonds and stocks, or will the divergence start to become more material in the new year? I, I, I think that the scales have tipped in the direction of equities here, right? Bonds have had a big move. They had an immediate move right off of that press conference. It may be overdone. I don't think we're necessarily going to get six cuts next year unless there's really some meaningful deterioration deterioration in the economy. Uh, but I think equities have a ways to go. Um, and I think you could see them test and challenge and surpass the old highs. That's always been our call. Even if you do end up having a recession, markets always hit a new time, a new all-time high before they do that. So I, I think there's a much better risk return in equities right now than there is bonds, and that's different from a month ago. I've seen lots of economists over the last few days trying to explain the difference between cutting interest rates and easing policy. Yeah. Do you think for markets that's a distinction without a difference? Look, again, I, I think it's about context, right? If you're talking about a couple of cuts that are trying to keep the real rate basically where it is, that's the behavior that you see in the very, very few soft landings historically. If it's aggressive cuts because you've got an unemployment rate that's rising and you've got defensives that are leading, then that's a much less benign scenario. And I think that everyone needs, you know, humility was something that if you didn't come into 23 with it, you probably should be leaving with some. Uh, I think you want to bring that into 24 um, <laughs> as you think through things and understand what's going on in the economy, what's going on in markets in the context of those cuts. Otherwise, you risk being humbled yet again. Would you like some more pushback from the Federal Reserve? This courtesy of Colby Smith over at the Financial Times, an interview with Loretta Mester, the president of the Cleveland Fed, with this to say, the next phase is not when to reduce rates, even though that's where the markets are at. It's about how long do we need monetary policy to remain restrictive in order to be assured that inflation is on that sustainable and timely path back towards 2%. Here's the big one. The markets are a little bit ahead. They jump to the end part, which is we're going to normalise policy, and I don't see that. Now, hawkish member of the FOMC, mm -hmm. we know that in Loretta Mester. 
But it's hard to say the market is wrong after what we heard in the news conference from Chairman Powell. I'm a little bit lost. What was Chairman Powell doing? Welcome in that to news the club, conference? John. I'm not alone, no, am I? Look, I mean, it makes sense to struggle here. It makes sense to ask questions about how long do we stay at this rate? When do we think we've gone too far and we want to remove some, some uh, of the tightening? It's just a communication strategy, which we were talking about before the air. It, it, it's, it's difficult when you've got the chair with a very, very duffish message and then members of the committee are walking it back. Again, I, I think that that, I, I miss the days when we guessed the size of the briefcase from Alan Greenspan. It was simpler, uh, rather than reading the tea leaves of the different comments. Well, they can't from put the, the toothpaste right. back in a tube now, can they? Well, and that's the it. issue. The market was ahead of the Fed. We were expecting, and I think most of the market was expecting Chair Powell to push back against that a little bit, not wanting financial conditions to loosen too much, and he didn't. Now, I can't imagine that that was a mistake. Now, I don't know if he's negotiating with the rest of the committee in public or if he's trying to get the market prepared for a, a series of more dovish messages as we get into 24. I, I think what the market has taken, though, is that in any event, hikes are off the table at this point. Do you think that he's bad at his job, or do you think that he just doesn't agree with most of the other members? Lisa, I have a hard enough time doing my job. I'm <laughs> going to criticize the chair of the Federal Reserve. No, I mean, he's got an impossibly difficult job. And I, I, I think, you know, my comment was I think he's always felt that there was some element of this inflation that was transitory. And you have seen it come down on the supply side, which, in fairness to him, is somewhat indicative of that. In that event, with rate hikes not really having been felt for the economy, there is a risk of over-tightening, and I think he wants to stick this landing on the soft landing. And so I think he's trying to push the public and maybe the committee into that direction. And you know what? He may not be wrong. He, he may not be wrong. Um, it's just when you have the pushback coming from other governors, it's hard to figure out how to interpret that message. Uh, that's what's difficult, I think, for that news conference. In the news conference, the chairman should be trying to represent the consensus on the committee not his own opinion. Shouldn't have been the opposite, shouldn't it? That's where I'm leaving this particular conversation scratching my head. I don't get it. To me, I think he's not that worried about financial conditions easing. And yeah. right now, I think that it's very hard, to your point, to really undo this message. I'm looking at two-year yields in response to Loretta Mester, unchanged. Mohamed al in this morning in the Financial Times, well worth a read. The line in the conclusion, the inflation round trip is neither simple nor complete. Much more on that a little bit later. Love this tweet out on Twitter this morning. Known as X, I know. Here's the post, new drinking game. Every time someone on Bloomberg says pushback, you're drunk by 6.12 in the morning. Does this even count as pushback though? That's my question. If nobody's taking it as pushback and more just like damage control, they've got to do their it's due diligence. It's not seen as credible, I'm with you. Yeah, and that's sort of what we're seeing this morning. That is without a doubt what we're seeing this morning. Steve Chevron, thank you, sir. Thanks for having Good me. See you. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas to you, sir. Merry thank Christmas. you very much. Looking at futures, equities positive by 0.2% on a seven-week winning streak on the S&P 500. This is the longest weekly winning streak going back to the end of 2017, November 2017, I believe. We'll speak to another equity market bull, Jay Puloski of TPW Advisory, who's feeling very good about himself. Looking at recent notes from Jay. Jay feels vindicated. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he does. By what we heard from last week. Got to talk about politics as well. We'll do that with Ed Mills and Raymond James. The latest polls, not great reading for the President of the United States. The hypothetical head-to-head -head over at Fox News in their recent poll, loss, 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 almost across the board. Well, it's been consistent and it doesn't matter who's doing the actual poll and what strikes me is the underperformance among younger individuals, uh, particularly within his own party. And that divergence of generations is something that's really marked with respect to a whole host of issues. We'll get to the details of that poll in around about five minutes. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie in the next hour as well. Plenty still to come this morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500 positive by 0.2%. Yields just a little bit lower by single basis point, 389.60. And in the FX market, the euro showing some strength despite some weak data, 109.10 on the euro against the dollar. From New York City this morning, good morning. agree with a lot of Trump's policies. I think he was the right president at the right time. But looking at the situation now, our country's in disarray, the world is on fire, and chaos follows him. And we can't have a country in chaos for four more years or we won't survive it. That was Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley speaking to ABC over the weekend as a new CBS poll show 
that Haley is closing in on Trump in New Hampshire. That's the latest for Nikki Haley. Things are looking better. For the President of the United States, things are looking worse. Lisa, this from Fox in hypothetical general election matchups against President Biden. Haley is ahead by six points. Trump is up by four. DeSantis and Biden tie. And as recently as August, according to their polling, Biden was narrowly ahead of all three of them. To me, what struck out uh, stuck out to me was a Wall Street Journal poll that kind of was another side of the same coin, saying that de Democrats and independents, 45 percent of them who were polled, said Biden's policies hurt them personally or had no impact on them. So he's losing on the economy, even though, by certain metrics, economists are talking about a really golden economy entering a new phase of expansion. Our poll was pretty brutal last week for the president of the United States. We've done this a few times now with Morning Consult. When respondents were asked which leader they trust more to handle the economy, it's President Trump, it's President Trump, it's President Trump, leading 51 to 33. That's a massive spread. 16% said neither. In this journal poll, 49% said Trump's policies personally helped them, just 37% said they hurt them. So again, it's the exact same kind of message. How much is this entirely tax cuts? How much is this the economic expansion? It doesn't matter. How much is this the messaging? Either way, Biden is not getting his message across and inflation is really uh, taking a bite out of some of the sentiment from voters. Ed Mills joins us now to have this conversation, Washington policy analyst over at Raymond James. Ed, let's start there. Is it personal? Is it the economy? Is it something people aren't seeing? Ed, what is it? Well, I think it's a combination of things, Jonathan. Uh, two things we always look here at Raymond James, approval rating, right track, wrong track. Uh, President Biden is underwater on both, especially on the right track, wrong track. And when people don't think you are doing a good job and do not think the country is on the right direction, those are flashing warning signs. Now, if it is a head-to-head -head matchup between Biden and Trump, one of the questions become is how much of it is a referendum on Biden or how much of it is a referendum on Trump? Because Trump also has very high negative ratings. And one of the things I think about as I compare these candidates is that Donald Trump is always one of those candidates that has a high floor, low ceiling because of the intensity of his support among his base. That floor for Biden is lower because there's less intensity. But in a head to head matchup, I still think this is a very close election, uh, which will be decided by a few you know, swing states come next November. So, Ed, are you saying that maybe the White House should just trust the calendar, that things will close over the next 12 months? I think they should be nervous. I don't think you can trust the calendar. I just think that there's a lot that needs to happen between now and next November. And I do think when I go around talking to kind of clients, I was in LA uh, with Raymond James last week, and there's this nagging sense that there's something that's going to happen in this race that's gonna upend things that we just don't know. Those unknown unknowns, um, people, think that we probably are going to see this rematch, but people are watching Haley. People are watching for a third party candidate. People are watching for that surprise. And so this far out in these head to head matchups does show flashing warning signs for Joe Biden. But I don't think anyone has great certainty right now as to who will be in the White House come inauguration day in 2025. We've spent years talking about the schisms in the Republican Party most recently with the House Speaker and the debacle around that. There's a question about how big the schism is between the Democratic Party in terms of the progressive wing and the rest of the Democratic Party and whether any Democratic candidate can really pair those at a moment that's incredibly polarized. Yeah, Lisa, and I think that's exactly part of the reason why you see Joe Biden polling relatively low is that schism for those folks that are not in favor of some of Biden's policies. They're not saying that they're going to vote for him. So the job of the Biden campaign is going to be making sure they have enough of a contrast against whomever establishes themselves as the Republican candidate, assuming it is Biden on the Democratic side, and get them to the polls. They can't have them sit out. They need to energize them. That's where his kind of floor is lower than Donald Trump because that intensity and that schism within the Democratic Party does not have anyone being rallied around at this time. We have another year of this. We're all very excited. There's a question of uh, whether there are specific aspects of the race that the market participants who you talk to are particularly interested in. Is it the deficit? Is it foreign policy? Is it something on the domestic front with border control? What is it from a market perspective that people are most trained on? 
Yeah, Lisa, it's all of the above. Um, first and foremost, we're going to have a really busy January. Uh, the Senate's still negotiating a potential border deal, which includes money for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan. Uh, that's probably getting kicked into January. But in January, we also have the Iowa caucus, the primaries in New Hampshire. Taiwan has an election. We have a potential government shutdown. There's 1% across the board cuts that get triggered because we didn't finish up our appropriations process here in Washington, D.C. Um, I am getting more questions about the debt and the deficit, how that plays into not only the election, but we look after the election. And there is the expiration of the Trump era tax cuts coming in the end of 2025. And so D.C. is more of a conversation for this market than historically. And I would just end that, Lisa, with the fact that when we look at the markets in presidential election years, January to March frequently is a weak period for the market because that has some of the most greatest uncertainty as the parties are choosing uh, their candidate. And so we have this kind of run up that we've had here. We've had this optimism because of the Fed. Will we see that continue into January and be an outlier? Or are we going to return to what we saw, especially, say, back in 2020, when it looked like Bernie Sanders might be the Democratic nominee and the volatility that caused in the market? Will we see a repeat of that? Or is there something that's going to emerge? Is Haley going to emerge? And that is going to kind of see a, a stronger market uh, than anticipated at this point. And I'm with you. Things get busy quickly. Let's start with January. Just give us those key dates. January, yeah. February, the deadlines where they have to come to some kind of agreement on spending. Yeah, so January 19th is the first deadline. February 2nd is the second deadline. What I'm watching with this border in kind of defense supplemental is do they require a bill to get funded also for the entire defense budget? Because if they were to do that, then Republicans, they have a stronger hand in pushing budget cuts elsewhere. And I don't think the market is prepared for those budget cuts. Um, if we have a government shutdown, one thing that we would highlight is that in the past, when the government is shut down, the market on average is up more than 3%. Uh, beyond that, it is the Iowa caucus on the 13th. The uh, 25th is the New Hampshire primary. So just jam-packed dates. And Congress returns on January 8th. And I mentioned the polling that came out of Fox over the weekend. Number one issue, both parties, the economy, the economy. The southern border is a close number two for Republican voters, doesn't feature that highly for Democrats. Is that where the fight's going to be early on next year? Yeah, so Jonathan, that is exactly why Republicans are insisting on getting something done on the border in exchange for that Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan aid. You look at House Republicans, they're on the floor of the House of Representatives saying they've got nothing done. They want to have the key issue for their constituents solved or at least have progress on that. So when they run on their own races in 2024, they can point to something. This is the one area where we know that there's still broad bipartisan support to get that aid package on the military side. And so they think rightfully this is their opportunity to talk about other national security issues the southern border and will be pushing now what they're asking for is more than what democrats want to give but unfortunately for democrats they're going to have to give it to get the other side of this funding done got it some unsettled business spilling over into 2024 ed thank you sir ed mills there of raymond james some breaking news on bp the latest reading as follows you will recall that there have been a series of attacks by Houthi militants off the coast of Yemen. Big shipping companies working out whether to send their crews through the Red Sea. We saw Mask and another big shipping company pause that just last week. BP to pause all oil tanker transits through the Red Sea. That headline crossing just moments ago. More on that in just a moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures on the S&P 500 positive by 0.2% on the S&P 500. Seven weeks of gains on the S&P. We have not had a week of losses since October. 
exactly the same winning streak on the Nasdaq 100. Futures up there by just 0.06%. But the massive outperformance has come from elsewhere. The Russell Moore recently, the small caps doing well. The banks are up 26% over the same period. So I'm going from the end of October. The banks are up 26% on the S&P 500, helped out by this move in the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, well off the highs of October. North of 5% in October, back down to 390 this morning, down almost a single basis point. Lisa, on the two-year, we were talking about 525, 526 in October. Now we're talking about 4 42 with the auto lover this morning by two basis points. Do you remember when we worried about the deficit? Remember we worried about who is going to buy all this debt? Yeah, like remember, two months ago. Yeah, exactly. Like all these stories that people bought into and then we had an auction and it was catastrophic and people were so concerned and it edified this feeling that this is a new era and suddenly it's back to the future and we're back to where we were before. Those issues haven't gone away. They're still with us, aren't they? This to me is the issue, that if anything, it makes it more likely that the Bank of Japan is going to move away eventually from negative rate policies and normalize uh, what's going on there. You're hearing a hawkish message from the Bank of England and from the ECB. So at a certain point, is there some room between where we were a month ago and where we are right now? Drinking buzzword of the day, pushback. We've had pushback from Williams of the New York Fed on Friday, from Goolsby of Chicago over the weekend from Mester of Cleveland this morning, and nobody seems to be listening. That's the interesting part of all of this. If you get any encouragement, you latch onto it. Any pushback, you ignore it. That's been the story now for a number of weeks, hasn't it? Fed Chair Jay Powell answered a question directly. He said, yes, we are talking about, you know, just the, roughly the timing of uh, rate cuts. We're beginning to talk about it. New York Fed President said they aren't really talking about rate cuts. So what constitutes really talking about it versus talking about it? Essentially, they brought it up, but they're not necessarily examining, doing a forensic analysis of exactly when they're going to cut rates. It doesn't count as pushback when you got the chair coming out and talking about it. The market is not listening. Let's turn to foreign exchange. The ECB tried to push back, but the data is just absolutely terrible. So none of it has any credibility. The euro is just about positive by 0.1%, 109.12. We did not hear Chairman Powell in that news conference, Lisa, on Thursday morning. What we heard from uh, ECB President Christine Lagarde was really uh, just sort of this feeling that they need to stick with it, this feeling that they're not thinking about rate cuts, this feeling that they are not the Federal Reserve. But the reality is no one was listening to her either because Fed Chair Jay Powell set the tone and the data just isn't there to support an economy that can withstand rates at this level for a prolonged period of time. Let's start there. Under surveillance this morning, German business expectations worsening for the first time since August, dampening hopes of a recovery in the nation's biggest economy. A gauge of expectations put out by the IFO Institute fell from the previous month. Analysts had been expecting a slight uptick. Lisa, you put together that with the PMIs on Friday. Not a great picture of what's happening in the European economy. Economy. It's the biggest economy in the region. So if it's having trouble, you have an issue here. So at this point, can you get the same kind of commitment to holding rates high, especially when inflation is coming in faster in some measures in Europe? Uh, or even relative to the U.S. I mean, the services sector isn't seeing the same kind of inflation that's, you know, inflecting upward in certain areas in the same way. So there's a real question here about how sticky this is and how much they're going to be able to deal with more disinflation heading into next year. Speaking of hits to business confidence, I promised you an update on this story. Here's the latest. BP pausing all oil tanker transits through the Red Sea. The announcement following an escalation of attacks on merchant shipping by Houthi militants. Mass making a similar announcement on Friday, about 12% of global trade depends on the Suez Canal. Clearly some big questions for the U.S. military, the administration, and for these companies. This, to me, is the big sleeper story of the next couple of weeks. To me, this is actually the most important thing to watch because, A, it has to do with a significant portion of global trade. B, you're dealing with this question, a real breaking apart of uh, certain Middle Eastern allies and the U.S. in terms of how to deal with this because the allegiance of different people are behind different factions about how to really counter this. And then you have this issue of, OK, well, what does this mean for supply chains? Do we then get an inflationary pop if you can't? can't get some of these goods shipped, or at least not the same kind of deflation that we saw in the past couple of months. Do you remember that massive ship and everyone freaking out a couple of years ago? Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. Well, this is that on steroids. That on steroids. OK. I'm just saying. OK. There's the update there. Here's the update on the south side. Goldman's David Costin already lifting his 2024 S&P 500 price target, seeing the index of 5,100 by the end of next year. Now, just a month ago, the price target was 4,700. Just a month ago. That's a big lift. Costum writing this. Equities were already pricing positive economic activity, but now reflect an even more robust outlook and clearly one that they are constructive about. What happened? 
with a robust outlook, there was one thing that happened, and that was Jay Powell. Without a doubt, that's the only thing that's changed in the last month, isn't it? He created the robust outlook that basically he wasn't going to push back and try to curtail this. Jan Hatsi has already had what they're calling a robust outlook over at Goldman Sachs. Exactly. They said the hard part was over, the easy part is still to come. And then Chairman Powell just gets some gasoline and pours it on a fire, doesn't he? <laughs> like, like, takes a know, lighter and, and just goes nuts. Chucks I mean, a match on a bonfire. Let's go. You know, you said something earlier, and I think we have to really uh, stick to this. Does the data confirm it? And a lot of people are saying, like Neil Dutta, that there is nothing in the data to be inflationary. Everything's going to be disinflationary in the next couple of months. So if that's the case, does this just keep running regardless of, of any kind of pushback? Because the data is going to confirm the disinflation, and we know the reaction function, at least, of Fed Chair Powell. That if is not a big if in a mind of Neil Dutta. I'm really pleased to say that revisiting us around a table is Priya Misra, portfolio manager at JP Morgan Asset Management. Morning, Priya. We were talking last week on Wednesday going into that news conference with Chairman Powell pushback. I was with you. Surely we were going to get pushback from the chairman. We didn't get any. Your point, I think, is an important one. Are we dusting off the 2019 playbook? And for those that might have forgotten, what is the 2019 playbook? So in 2019, what the Fed did was try to, uh, you know, cut rates. They cut rates 75 basis points, really trying to extend the cycle. I think this is the Powell Fed. This is the Fed that says once they get the green light from inflation, what did surprise me was how quickly they're convinced that inflation is actually going to head all the way back down to 2%. They're trying to get that soft landing. They're really, really trying to get that. And if that means that they can normalize policy, that they can get real rates, I think, closer to 1%, one and a quarter they think they can actually extend the cycle, that we don't get that recession. I think it's a little, you know, a uh, little, uh, little bit of a risky move here, because what if inflation does stall? But if you're at two and a half, that's not that far from two. Now, whether it'll work or not, I think that's the trade for six months out. Right now, we're in immaculate disinflation. We're seeing growth slow down, but not to recession levels. And they're hoping that by these preemptive rate cuts, that they can actually, uh, uh, you know, get that... Uh, get that soft landing. Language matters. You didn't say easing. You said normalize. What's the difference? There's a big difference. Not to, not, not every rate cut is, is essentially created equal. I think the Fed right now, the market's hearing the Fed is, is cutting to the Fed is easing. I think what they're trying to do is get rates to some sort of neutral level. We don't know what neutral is. Now, we'll be debating our star for the next year. You know, what's that level at, at which point uh, policy is essentially accommodative? We're very far from accommodative. In fact, Chair Powell said that last week. He said we're well within restrictive territory. Normalizing, in my mind, is getting rates to, you know, uh, Fed funds to 75, 3%, something in, in that range. Easing would be well, uh, you know, below that. We're talking 1%, 2%. The market right now is pricing in normalizing. So when I hear that too much is getting priced in, no, we're pricing in inflation getting back down close to 2%, 2, 2.5%. And, uh, you know, growth in that 1% range, 275 or 3% Fed funds is normalizing. I actually think we still don't price in this chance that the Fed may have to cut well through that because they're trying to extend the cycle. But what if the damage has already been done? What if the lags kick in? I think there's a chance that the Fed may have to cut, you know, well south of that 3% level, which the market's not pricing in, which is why I think there's more room for rates to decline. Why do you think there are so many Fed officials lining up to push back on what we heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell, if it is consistent with what they, what they hope to do? I think they're really trying to prevent getting bullied by the market to cut all the way down to zero or 1%. Whether that'll work or not, I think the market's the saying... The market's not even bullying them to that degree. They're only billing them 150 basis points. Exactly. But what if the growth data does start to slow down? Then I think the market might say, well, you're going all the way down to zero. And I think the Fed is saying, well, there's a very different bar. There's a different bar to normalizing. We've, we've reached that bar. And then there's a different bar to actually take rates into accommodative territory. It's a very nuanced message, but it's very hard for the market to actually make that, for the, for the Fed to make that point, and secondly, for the market to hear it. So I think the trade for today is the Fed's going to ease. They're trying to get that soft landing. Until we see data that it's not working, it's risk on. Well, but here's my issue. There was a time when we thought that the easing in financial conditions mattered, that it actually would have some sort of stimulative effect on the economy and potentially on inflation. Fed Chair Jay Powell had an opportunity. He had a softball to respond to that, to basically lean into that message. He did not. Do we take a message from that, that they don't care about the easing in financial conditions? Or do we take a lesson from all of the other Fed officials that are trying to say it still does matter? So I think financial conditions are always context dependent, meaning, you know, financial conditions have eased, 
but so has inflation. Inflation's come back down. Look at three-month moving averages. We're running, you know, south of two and a half percent, and the growth data is weakening. I mean, if you, even if you look at payrolls, which is the strongest part of the economy, if I strip out a few sectors, it's actually looking pretty weak. The consumer is levering up, and uh, you know, we are seeing uh, essentially a pickup in default. So I think if the household sector is starting to weaken, the Fed looks at the easing in financial conditions and says, actually, it's appropriate. So I don't think they push back. Now, if we see a reacceleration in growth, absolutely, the Fed's going to push back. If we see inflation stalling out, I think they'll say not so fast. But for now, if growth is slowing down, I think financial conditions matter a lot less. Let's go through the levels. Two year right now, 442. 10 year at the moment, 390. 30 year, just above 4%. How much space is there for yields to fall from here, given everything you've just told us? I mean, it is going to depend on the data. My view is things are slowing. And even though financial conditions are easing, the Fed's talking about rate cuts, it's hard for that to have an impact on the economy that quickly. So I think the zero to five or seven year part of the curve can absolutely decline a lot more. We should price in at any point a 10, 15% chance of a recession. You start to put that in, and then you're looking at the 10 year or the five year closer to 3%. So I think there is room for it to decline. It may not be a straight line. We've a pretty long way very quickly. Two months ago, we were at 5% on 10s. We were talking about, you know, the supply narrative. So it's it's moved a long way. I think it can consolidate, but I don't think we're getting much of a backup. So I would use any backup as an opportunity to buy. I think we can have a pretty flat curve around 3% for the next few months. Well, let's talk about the shape of the curve. I'm pleased you went there. You've alluded to this. Just why is this curve still at negative 51, two-year versus 10-year? Why aren't we getting that classic end of cycle bull steep to come through. What's happening? I think that's, you know, uh, to your question earlier around normalization versus easing. I think the market, that's the part of the market that understands. So this Fed is not talking about easing all the way down to zero. The curve will really steepen, I think, when we see signs that we're in, in front of a hard, that a hard landing is in front of us. If we're still in a soft landing, I think we have a very flat curve. There should be some term premium there. But here's my pushback to term premium. There's six trillion sitting in money market funds. It's felt, cash has felt good, right? I'm earning more. If the Fed hikes more, well, I'll earn more. Well, now, actually, think about reinvestment risk. As the Fed starts to cut rates, those rates are not going to stay that high. Money is going to move out, and it's not obvious to me that it all moves to stocks. When real rates are close to 2%, well, bonds start to look very attractive as well. You said things were slowing. Can we finish there? What is guiding you? Where are you looking across your dashboard right now, looking at various economic indicators? What's guiding your assessment of where this economy is going? Because I've looked at a range of forward-looking indicators for a while now. have been signaling slowdown, and then Q3 happened. So what are you looking at? Right. So, you know, I think Q3, part of why Q3 happened or, or, the, or that strength in the data was real incomes surging. Inflation declined, but wages were still high. Well, that's starting to decline because if, if you look at wage growth, so what I'm looking at is I'm basically looking at the, the household sector. So I'm looking at small business hiring. That sentiment seems to be slowing, um, you know, and, and I'm looking at the consumer. So at the margin, you're seeing cracks. We still don't know if the cracks will be systemic enough. And can the Fed, this preemptive easing, actually prevent the cracks from, de uh, from deepening? But there are, there are cracks in terms of the consumer uh, you know, leverage, in terms of consumer defaults, delinquencies. So there's signs of trouble. I think it's still too early to say, is this hard landing? But we should put in some probability of a hard landing there. Priya, it's good to see you. Always is. Priya Misra there of JP Morgan Asset Management. Lisa, just on the difference between easing and normalization, which is something we've been talking about in the last hour. Which is the reason why the Fed does have a kind of a nuanced message uh, to send out there. How do they convince them? This is just normalizing, not actually easing. And is that a distinction without a difference of financial exactly. markets that are absolutely ripping? More coverage still to come. The outlook from Wells Fargo. Up next from New York, this is Bloomberg. Even if you manage to skirt around a recession, which is certainly possible and the data doesn't show that we're in imminent danger, but even if you do, there is likely going to be a growth scare time just because there's so much optimism in the markets right now. Based on what we've seen, the Fed is likely going to try and be as quiet as it can for the next several months. I'm laughing out loud. Gin and Emmanuel of Evercourt, they're doing anything but staying quiet. 
going into the Christmas period. We're hearing from more of them. Lisa Williams on Friday, Goresby over the weekend, Mester in the Financial Times this morning. And they're all trying to basically sing from the opposite hymn book of Jay Powell. Again, this goes to the question, what are they worried about? Are they worried about financial conditions getting carried away? Are they worried about being bullied by the market, as Priya Miser was saying? Or are they just trying to uh, be the last voice before the end of the year to try to I don't know, be responsible amid a party? I'll try and be responsible. Prudent to maybe reintroduce some two-way risk after what we heard from Chairman Powell and Good what luck. we saw in markets after that, precisely. <laughs> it's just not landing. It's not landing at all. Well, I'm sorry. When the chair speaks, the chair speaks. And if he's on a different page than the rest of the committee, well, then we have another problem. Well, Chairman Powell Wednesday was on a different page to Chairman Powell 12 days before. So keep up. To Julian Emanuel's point, Thanks. the bar has reset, <laughs> not you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. The bar has reset big time going into 2024. Wells Fargo calling for the economy to contract next year. The economist Shannon Siri Grind writing this. There are unmistakable signs that momentum in this economy is downshifting and cracks are beginning to appear in the household sector. Shannon, I'm pleased to say, joins us now. Shannon, we're going to dive deep into the Fed speak in just a moment, but your outlook is calling for that contraction. Where are you seeing weakness currently and why do you think that continues into next year? Yeah, so we're still seeing some of those early uh, cracks in the economy. So we still think recession risks are elevated into next year. Um, obviously, we think the Fed is done at this point and it really comes down to when they start to ease policy, where I think you could potentially avoid that contraction and achieve this soft landing. But we've, what we've been really trying to stress for clients is a soft landing or a mild contraction is probably not going to feel all that different, right? We're, we're looking for slow growth in 2024. And in terms of where those cracks are really starting to materialize, we are starting to see some in the, in the household sector. So the household sector is in decent financial shape at a very high level, but those initial vulnerabilities are starting to rise with delinquencies ticking higher, uh, interest expenses starting to pick up as well. So I think you're starting to see a household sector that's beginning to think about changing their behavior. So Shannon, I thought that Chairman Powell had started to change his behavior as well. In the news conference last week, I heard a chairman that was entertaining a conversation about rate cuts. Then Williams spoke mm -hmm. on Friday to CNBC. Goolsby spoke over the weekend, Mester this morning to the Financial Times. How credible are those clarifications from those Fed speakers? I think we should be paying very close attention to what the Fed speakers are saying at the moment. So I think Powell surprised most of us with, with how dovish he, he was at, at the recent press conference. And I think we're seeing some of that being walked back by the, by the latest speakers. I think the market has just gotten really excited about easing. And I think speaker, the Fed speakers are trying to walk back some of that so that they don't see an, an overly accommodative stance happen in terms of financial conditions that puts them in a more precarious situ situation as we go into next year with inflation still meaningfully above target. They still have work to do. They need to remain in this restrictive stance for some time. So I think they're trying to walk back some of that market excitement to the best they can after uh, Powell's more dovish comments last week. Let's pair these ideas together. I love how you say they're beginning to think about changing their behavior, talking about households, and sort of beginning to think about rate cuts over at the Federal Reserve. And you put these two things together and you wonder if some of the uh, accommodation that we've seen in markets will change people's thought process in households who are thinking about changing their behaviors to be a, a little bit uh, less, uh, I don't know, uh, bully it when it comes to shopping. I mean, is that what you're seeing, that you think that, that financial conditions matter a whole lot at this junction? I do think they matter for households more than we would think so just but based on how they um, follow markets. So what I mean by that is I think that consumers have been remarkably resilient over the past few years. I think the wealth effect has something to do with that, just given how uh, sturdy their financial situation has been and the rise in equities, the fall in yields. I think that could add to some um, some soft or some uh, further strength in consumers um, more than we're expecting. So our forecast is for some continued moderation through the fourth quarter into early next year as some of those unique factors that have helped support spending over the past year have begun to fade, like excess liquidity, easy access to credit, the things we've really been stressing in recent months. But if you continue to see this accommodation um, in financial markets and, and rise in, in some of these val equity values and things like that, that can help bolster financials, I do get a little bit worried that we continue to see strength in the consumer. And I use the word worried because our forecast obviously calls for some contraction. But also, what does that mean for, for the Fed in terms of policy next year? How does that translate to inflation? Um, and, and where does that put the Fed in terms of when they're actually able to ease? And where is that money coming from. Shannon, I spent the weekend thinking a lot about buy now, pay later, especially mm -hmm. because that's hidden from a lot of the credit agencies. It's hidden from a lot of the other debt loads that people have, and yet it's accounting for almost 10 percent of recent online shopping during uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday. How concerned are you about the segment that's kind of flying under the radar? 
Yeah, we're, we're growing a bit more concerned about it, particularly because it's extremely difficult to measure. As you say, it's not it's not gathered or, or ca tallied by credit agencies, and it's it's a little bit of a of a, a phantom debt, is what we've been referring to it as. So it's it's growing more of a concern for us, particularly as households use it in terms of their holiday spending patterns. So I think that suggests that you might not be able to get as as clean of a read on some of this high frequency data. So the retail sales data, for instance, last week came in above expectations, and that surprised us, particularly based on the BEA's high frequency credit card data. So coming from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which looked for a large decline. And part of that could be, you know, using some of these buy now, pay later programs, which aren't being captured in some of that data. So we're growing more concerned. I think it's it's an area that to pay very close attention to with the data we do have. Um, and it, it just kind of puts um, lenders in a more in a more difficult situation as well as they try to make some loans to consumers and maybe don't have the full picture in terms of their financial burden. So it's, it's, it's a growing vulnerability for sure. So the next logical question for me, Shannon, do you think there is space, given what we do know, for the consumer to re-leverage going into next year? So I think the leverage environment for the consumer is is shifting in the sense that households have taken on increasing debt coming out of the pandemic after after paying some down in the initial uh, year or so during the pandemic. Um, and I think we're in a more uh, challenging position for households to continue to take on debt. Not only have banks tightened their standards at a, at a pace that's consistent with recession, but interest rates are higher, which just makes it less affordable for consumers to continue to rely on that source of purchasing power. So our expectation is households are going to gradually pull back on some of more traditional um, debt uh, components and rely more on their income. So for us, the trajectory is is for that mild contraction that we have in the forecast, but it really depends on the labor market. If the labor market remains sturdy and you see a moderation without significant layoffs, I think households can continue to spend, particularly if their real income uh, remains uh, pretty sturdy. So the outcome really depends on the income as we think about the consumer for next year. Where's the bigger risk right now, Shannon, in going into next year? Is it a rapid deterioration in the economy? or is it sticky inflation that doesn't get back to 2%, especially with a Fed that's easing or normalizing or whatever you want to call it? You know, it's tough to say at this point. I think it might be a little bit more of a deterioration. Uh, I think the inflation trajectory is very much in train. As I think about the Fed and, and how they uh, think about easing, it's it's not necessarily um, the, the headline figures con continuing to come down, because we do we are forecasting a continued decline in both the core and headline inflation metrics. But it's really going to depend on that composition, which Prior to last, uh, the last press conference, we heard Powell stressing in terms of that super core component, right, getting that core services component lower. And while I think the risks of the outlook are, are pretty balanced at this point, I mean, we do have that modest contraction in the forecast. A rapid deterioration doesn't seem uh, too likely just because I think consumers are still in decent shape and the labor market is showing signs of moderation, but not an imminent recession. So I think really the composition of inflation is going to be very key in, in making sure that households are, are moderating their spending, but not actually uh, pulling back to be consistent with the imminent contraction. So a little bit a little bit of a mixed bag. Shannon, this was great. Let's do this again soon. Shannon Siri Grind there of Thank Wells you. Fargo. Let's take stock of the last 50 minutes or so, Lisa. So it just seems that for many people there is a big difference between easing and normalization. And I go back to a question I've asked multiple times in the last hour or so. For financial market participants, is that a distinction without a difference? I don't think it makes a difference to many people. I would agree, because essentially it's taking uh, one of the potential headwinds off the table, which is a Fed that remains higher for a prolonged period of time, even in the face of disinflation. In other words, another leg of more restriction. Are we going to hear more about this from Fed speakers? Just this kind of surgical rate cut story that Neil Dutter was talking about. When inflation starts to come down, you want to focus on real rates, not nominal, does it keep matter, it consistent. Though? But to your exact point, I does it matter? I don't think for markets it does I at think all. A cut is a cut. And if you don't have that potential uh, pressure on markets, especially at a time where there is disinfl disinflation, people are going to view that as bullish. You're always thinking about the next move. And if it's a cut, the one after that is a cut because there is a belief that this starts a cycle of cuts. And it also shows that the bias is not necessarily to remaining uh, late to the party, that the transitory discussion wasn't something that was deeply scarring that's going to make the Fed uh, a lot more hesitant to cut rates, and that's a difference. Let's speak to a man who wasn't late to the party. He arrived six months early and was waiting for everyone else to turn up. <laughs> It's Jay Pulaski at TPW. Jay joins us next on this program. Equity futures on the S&P 500, positive hit by 0.1% on the S&P. Yields are doing nothing on a 10-year, but they've been doing something big time over the last month. Your 10-year, 390. The message we got from the Fed 
was very much an all clear. The markets responded in kind. This market is behaving in a way that thinks that rate cuts are absolutely imminent and that we're going to have this Goldilocks scenario. And I don't currently see that. A lot of the drivers for higher rates haven't left the market. There is some skepticism around how much is the Fed ultimately going to cut. Whether it comes to the Fed's forecast being realized or the market expectations being realized, I think the truth in the end will lie somewhere in between. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Right now, the truth is whatever you want it to be in this financial market. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Brabitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P is just about positive by 0.1% following seven weeks of gains on the S&P 500. Chairman Powell started a rate cut party. The conversation was already going. The markets boozed up. And Mester Williams and Goolsby want you all to have a strong black coffee. No one's having it. Exactly especially because right now the party keeps on going. And frankly, people feel edified about this idea of surgical cuts, whatever you want to call them. The Fed is done hiking rates. That's number one. That is quite clear. And number two, they are quite clearly preparing to understand what the triggers will be to start cutting rates starting next year. My favorite quote, absolutely favorite quote of the last month or so, Jack Caffrey, JP Morgan, what a year. November's been. So let's go back to November. You're publishing your outlook. You're feeling good about gains in 2024. And then November happens and you add in a little bit of December and all of a sudden you reassess and you think maybe we should put out a new outlook. David Costin, Goldman Sachs. Hello, sir. 5,100 on the S&P year end next year, mid-November, 4,700. Lisa, they hiked their price target big time. 9% gain, I believe, from the original price target to the one that he put out about a month later. So what changed to have a more robust backdrop? One thing. The Fed was not going to be late to cut rates. That suddenly changed the game. That was one of the big risks for market participants was that they were going to be preconditioned by the debacle of transitory. It turns out instead of being preconditioned about some sort of shame with transitory, they are re-embracing it because maybe, hey, it's the truth after all. This to me is the game changer at a time where people were looking for excuses to be bearish and have none now. Speaking of bearish, Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley, even Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley is getting into the festive spirit. Here's the quote. This is a bullish outcome for stocks, a bullish outcome for stocks. So let's go back to what Julian Emanuel of Evercore has been saying. Just how high have we reset the bar now? into 2024? Well, this is a good question, right? And this is something that we are hearing more on the margins, that this is sort of a blow off top and that we're going to rally into year end. And then the first quarter is going to be rocky. We've heard that from one person after another, including Michael Purvis, including a whole host of others. Julian Emanuel sees that as well, that next year is going to be rocky. It's going to be more of the same. But what's going to be the trigger? Is it going to be the cold water that Fed officials are trying to cast for this? I don't think so, because they're not doing a very good job right now based on the market uh, reaction. Is it going to be the earnings? This, to me, is a question, or the cracks that maybe people are beginning to think about thinking about seeing. Thinking about thinking about rate cuts as well? Is that where the Federal Reserve's at now? <laughs> I don't know. They were, they were saying it. They're not talking about it. Just they're not thinking really about thinking talking about it. Okay, about okay. It. It's a big difference. Thanks for that clarification there. Let's get to the scores. This market's still rallying. Your equity market's positive on the S&P 500. It's higher by 0.2%. Yields are a little bit lower by a single basis point. 390 on a 10-year. In foreign exchange, the euro, just about positive by 0.16% on that currency pair against the dollar, Lisa. 109.12. All right. So this is what we're looking at this week. It's the last week of the year, basically, before everybody goes on vacation or maybe it's just us. But here's the thing. Tuesday, the Bank of Japan rate decision, the thing that's sort of the sleeper uh, issue that a lot of people were expecting, maybe they would move away from negative rate policies. Now people aren't thinking that it's going to be this week. But still, I mean, again, talking about potential tail risks, could this be something that upends some of the uh, euphoria? Wednesday, Treasuries auctions don't matter until they do. The Treasury Department is selling $13 billion of 20-year bonds after that incredible rally. Does it hold after more than a percentage point of a decline in the yield from the peak just about a month and a half ago? And Friday, to me, this is the other potential issue. What happens if the data doesn't cooperate with the euphoria of disinflation that we're seeing in markets? U.S. November personal income and spending comes out, as well as the core PCE deflator, which has been coming in now about 3.4%. Does it keep coming in or do we get sort of a plateauing? Neil Dutta says just the comps show that it will. Lisa, thank you. That's your week ahead. Let's get straight to the conversation. Jay Piloski is fat lonely all year, constructive on the equity market. Now he's got company. 
tons of company. The founder and principal of TPW Advisory joins us now. Jay, it's wonderful to catch up with you, sir. How good does that external validation feel for you this morning? Well, it's been, uh, it makes up for a uh, warm, wet and uh, windy Monday morning in New York City. That's for sure. So, no, it's, um, you know, as you guys have been talking about, you and Lisa and, and others, uh, markets have rallied. They've rallied right in your face. It's been very difficult to stand aside. It's the classic, as we talked about, year-end rally. You have a gate, a calendar end of the year. You're underperforming because you have cash. You have to participate. And I read something on, uh, in FinTwit over the week where it was like pain levels 10 out of 10, right? So there's a lot of pressure on people to perform uh, in this period. And so there, there's a big chase going on. And as you see, it's uh, continuing now uh, into week eight. Jay, you weren't bullish for the sake of being bullish. So let's talk about your framework, the process. You've been calling for this return to macro stability away from what we've been experiencing over the previous 12, 18, 24 months. Jay, why are you still so convinced by that? And why is that the big outlook for you next year? Yeah, I, th I would say, John, it's actually been three years, right? We've been in three years since COVID of, um, you know, lots of volatility, uh, you know, the inflation spike, the central bank response, uh, all these things have manifested. We've had conflict, we've had climate issues. So it's been a period the last three years of macro volatility. And my view is that we're now exiting that period and we're entering a period of macro stability. All that stuff is in the background. It's all been, it's in the past, it's been priced in, it's been discounted. And going forward, I think the outlook is, is pretty, uh, pretty positive. The Fed is done. We're moving from a rate hike cycle to a rate cutting cycle. We have uh, economies that are doing reasonably well. The U.S. is growing this quarter at 2.5%, probably going to grow 2.5% for the year. Next year, consensus is 1.5%. It's quite likely that that's going to be revised up, as you've talked about people revising up their targets. Europe is bottoming. People love to bash Europe, but European equities have also been up seven weeks in a row. And then you have China, you know, struggling to get going on the traction front, but still growing at 5% per annum. So I think the, the negative outlook on things is just misplaced. It's been revealed to be misplaced by the market reaction. Market knows better than any one of us what is going to happen. And that's why it's forward looking. And that's why you in turn have to be forward looking. And so when we did our 24, our 24 outlook, we had four macro surprises. One of them, the first one was lower than expected inflation, sooner than expected. That's already playing out. And the market is reacting to that. Another one is a return to macro stability and the unlock that it can present in terms of all that money, well over a trillion dollars that went into money market funds, can now start to come out. And that's why I think, well, the market is surely going to take a pause and surely going to pull back. And that's all good, natural and healthy. There's so much money that needs to participate that I think that macro stability, the unlock of all that money that went into money market funds, provides a nice cushion so that I don't think you have to worry about a big downdraft. Uh, in 2024. You've been enthusiastic about non-U.S. stocks for quite a while, including European banks. You were early to this party as well. Now we are seeing that broadening out. How much more conviction do you have now than, say, six months ago that that can continue? Yeah, no, great question, Lisa. And, and look, our view, our, our framework has been very simple. We believe in keeping things simple. Uh, lower inflation leads to lower rates, leads to a weaker dollar leads to better outperformance outside the U.S. and good performance for commodities. Our Friday musings last week were, was titled Get Real. And the case we made was to get real means get real assets. And so we're really constructive on emerging markets, uh, both debt and equity. They've been the huge laggard. Uh, no one owns them, completely uh, underpriced, completely dismissed. Um, we see big opportunities in EM around the regionalization of supply chains. This fits right, John, you talk about framework. Our framework is the tripolar world, regional deepening in Asia, Europe, and the Americas. And we're finally starting to see the opportunity to invest in that thesis with emerging markets, Mexico and the Americas, Poland in Europe, Vietnam in Asia, beneficiaries of the regionalization process. 
And then just to finish on commodities, commodities are the one thing that have been participated. And yet, what is a big beneficiary of a weaker dollar and lower interest rates? Commodities. And so that's the opportunity, as we see it right here. If you want to buy something now, you buy commodities. You buy oil, you buy copper, you buy gold miners, um, you buy ag. We're exposed across the spectrum. So our two big bets for next year, emerging markets and commodities. Just real quick, can you take a page from Ray Dalio's book and say cash is trash at this point? <laughs> um, uh, you know, cash is definitely uh, a laggard. And that's what I said six months ago and everyone loved it. It's going to be a laggard. So yes, cash, you make 4%. Equities are up 20%. I would rather have the 20%. And so that's what's going to take money out of the money market fund and put it into risk assets as we return to macro stability in 24 and 25, in my view. Very wise, Jay, because when people do call it trash, typically bad things happen. That was the right way, Lisa, to answer that question. All right, there we go. That's called diploma, uh, diplomacy. Although I will say that his note, I just have to read the way that it began. Wow, one has to admit that external validation, especially from a well-respected source like the Fed, sure feels good. This is someone who is definitely taking a victory lap after uh, a really stellar year. It's well-deserved. Jay, enjoy the Christmas holiday, sir. It's good to catch up. Jay Pulaski there of TPW on the latest. Just on energy, what he had to say there on some of the laggards, really important. We've seen this rally broaden out big time, beyond big tech. The banks have absolutely ripped off the lows of October. Since the end of October, the S&P 500 is up something like 12.5%. Energy stocks on the S&P down 2%. That's where the underperformance has been. It's because we've had, what, seven straight weeks of declines in oil prices. I think that it, we eked out a bit of a gain last week for the first time in quite a while. But this has really been... A surprise, and it's really on the heels of shale production in the U.S. And so at what point can you really game out the trajectory when it's affected by supply that people hadn't been counting on before? Producing more than 13 million barrels a day in the United States of America. If you are just joining this program, welcome to this program. Your equity market shaping up as follows. Positive here by 0.2%. Yields a little lower by a single basis point at 389.97 on a US 10-year. In the FX market, 109.13 on the euro against the dollar. Positive there by 0.2%. Crude is rallying. I can tell you nat gas is as well in Europe too. I want to sit on this story and we'll build on it with Anne-Marie in just a moment. BP is pausing all oil tanker transits through the Red Sea. We heard a similar story from Maersk at the end of last week. The announcement, of course, following an escalation of attacks on ships by Houthi militants. Lisa, this is one to watch. It's building gradually over the last few days. Since December 15th, four of the world's five biggest container shipping uh, companies have paused or suspended their services in the Red Sea. Just to give you a sense of what else is happening around the world, in addition to oil tankers that also are uh, not passing through there, what does this do to the price? What does this do to the geopolitics if the U.S. is saying, we got to stop this to keep uh, shipping going, and they can't get an agreement with other Middle Eastern allies. This is a very uh, difficult moment, especially at a time that's pretty tenuous in the region. And this is 12% of global trade. It's no doubt important. We'll keep building on this story with Anne-Marie in about five minutes. Later in the hour, we'll catch up with Elliot Ackerman on the nature of the war. We'll get to that a little bit later. Then on the markets, Mira Pandit of JP Morgan Asset Management will kick off the next hour on Bloomberg Surveillance. The next hour, about 47 minutes away. Let's sit on the price action right now. Equities lifting again on the S&P 500 by a quarter of 1%. The run has been absolutely phenomenal. Seven weeks of gains on the S&P 500, the longest weekly winning streak, going back to November 2017, encouraged by Chairman Powell. As for the rest of them, we're just going to ignore them. The pushback from, from Goldsby, from Mester, from Williams. Apparently, this market does not care. More on that a little bit later. From New York, good morning. close is the Senate to any sort of deal on the border that would then also allow Israel and Ukraine funding to pass? Well, let me just say this, that I have been communicating with the negotiators, my, my colleagues and friends on the Democrat and Republican side, also with the White House, too, and I'm very encouraged. I'm very optimistic. They're moving in a very positive way. 
They understand that the border is broken. The border is broken, wide open, some might say. That was Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia speaking on CNN, seeing optimism in a potential border deal, a solution, if you will. There's still work to do in Washington. There's still work to do in the Middle East. The latest story coming from BP in the last hour or so, pausing all oil tanker transits through the Red Sea. We heard something similar from Mess going into the weekend just last week, following an escalation of attacks on merchant shipping by Houthi militants. Let's get some clarity on the story. Anne-Marie joins us down in Washington, our chief Washington correspondent. MH, let's go there. How tricky is that situation going through the Suez Canal currently? Oh, well, it's incredibly tricky now that they've pulled this transport through the Red Sea because now they're going to have to use more tankers. They're going to have to go around the Horn of Africa. So um, the fact that they did this, the fact that this is going to create more issues for their supply chains, more issues for their fuel consumption, you have to imagine that they are very concerned. Now, the Biden administration is, of course, weighing what they can do when it comes to these Houthi attacks. Do they potentially go directly after the Houthis? Um, one source I spoke to this morning is talking about the fact that within the Biden administration, there is debate about potentially getting involved in a longer term uh, protracted Houthi potential um, conflict. There also is talk of maybe a maritime consortium to be there in the Red Sea to protect it. So these are the active conversations happening right now. And we should note we have seen a lot of diplomacy within the region. Um, the president's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, was just in the UAE. We also have today Lloyd Austin in the region. He'll also be going to Israel. So there's a lot of discussions from the White House and the Defense Department about what to do regarding the Red Sea and these critical shipping lanes. People have been talking also about disagreements within some of the U.S.'s Middle Eastern allies about which factions to support and how to best counter the Houthi militants. How much credence do you put into those stories? Well, I think at the end of the day, because you're going to the Saudis and the Emiratis are going to want to make sure that it is a safe and secure region, they'll come to an agreement. But they just support different parts uh, of the factions in Yemen. But I think really at the end of the day, it really comes down to what the United States plan is going to be in the region. Um, and then the potential to be able to get Riyadh and Abu Dhabi on board. You mentioned that Lloyd Austin is heading to Israel. Uh, he is the Secretary of Defense, and he is expected to go there with a message. Start moving to a new phase of war that is more targeted with individual uh, units that are much more specialized going in for select targets. How big of a shift is this, and how urgent is this message, and will it even be heard? Well, already the message has come from the White House to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and to the Israeli government that they need to start winding down this war in weeks. The New York Times reported the end of the year. My own reporting is a little bit more closer to the middle of January. They want this war over. And when you have to look at what is going on in Israeli own reporting, I mean, there was an issue over the weekend where the IDF actually shot and killed Israeli hostages. Um, so it does look like there is an immense amount of pressure building from the foreign community, now also the United States on board, for the Israelis to start winding this down. The Palestinian death toll now is north of 18,000 people. Um, this is incredibly uh, devastating and complicated for this administration as well. And Lloyd Austin is going to be there to be another voice to add that pressure to the Israeli government. Amory, let's talk about that pressure. Is it building domestically within Israel as well? Well, there's a lot of concerns within Israel about Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, this has been growing since even before uh, the Hamas war started, before Hamas's uh, terrorist attack in southern Israel. There has been a lot of concerns about Benjamin Netanyahu, where he wanted to take the government and their democracy with the judicial overhaul. And now there's a lot of concerns within the Israeli people about how did this happen and the security concerns. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of pressure building on that government, as well as people who want to make sure that about civilian lives not being lost, especially those Israelis that are still in Hamas's control in Gaza. They want to make sure that these individuals can come out alive and safely. It's absolutely tragic. Let's just finish on this for the president. How much are his own polls dictating how he approaches this foreign conflict? 
Not even sure if this is in the polls, Jonathan, because the polls continue to show that it's not really foreign policy that American voters are concerned about. It's the economy and across the board, whether it's inflation, whether it's interest rates, Americans think former President Donald Trump would have a better handle on the economy. But when it comes to the youth vote, our polling has showed that they want more to be done for the Palestinians in Gaza than than what the U.S. US government is currently doing. And you have to remember, the youth came out um, in pretty big numbers for President Biden in 2020. Will they do that again come November? The head-to-heads for the president don't look good. Amory, just to wrap up with a poll from Fox over the weekend, hypothetical general election matchups against President Biden, Haley ahead by six points, Trump's up by four, DeSantis is tying. According to Fox, as recently as August, Biden was narrowly ahead of all three of them. Just going back to late summer, and Marie, we've discussed this a few times, just the arc of this conversation. Initially, the White House pushed back against the importance of these polls. Are you hearing the same thing now? Of course, they're going to push back against the importance of these polls. They're going to say we have 11 months still to go. And they'll also point to the fact that everyone was talking about a red wave when it came to the midterm elections, and that did not materialize. Um, but the fact of the matter is you are seeing the president do a lot more fundraisers. He's sitting on a massive war chest that they haven't quite put to use yet. But that is certainly going to ramp up, really, as we turn after the Christmas holidays. We go into Iowa. We go into New Hampshire. All of that campaigning and where did they decide to deploy that money, all of likely the swing states, uh, that will start to ramp up. But obviously for the campaign, when they hear these numbers, it is challenging because it's not just one fluke poll. It's poll after poll after poll. Potentially, and we've talked about this last week when Jay Powell did a little bit of his pivot, Jonathan, after you mentioned 12 days. The timeline may be on this administration's side. Inflation is coming down. They still have an unemployment rate below 4%. And potentially, they're going to have cuts at the Federal Reserve next year going into November. And the two are not connected in any way, shape or form, we're told. anne thank you. AMH down in Washington, D.C. It's quite a change. Got people asking a question, at least, over the last couple of weeks. Lisa, put it together. You've got inflation coming down. Unemployment still around four, which is historically tremendously low. You've got the Federal Reserve set in the minds of many to cut interest rates. Equity market absolutely ripping. You think the economy was doing pretty well. And then you look at the polling, number one issue is the economy for Republicans. Number one issue is the economy for Democrats. And yet we've got a president that is increasingly unpopular, not becoming more popular by many measures. And in Wall Street Journal polls that directly they feel like President Biden's policies have made them less successful and have hurt them personally. Uh, more and more. Even Democrats think that. More than half of voters say that they hurt them uh, overall for the general election. This is the opposite from the former President Trump. So how does he really change this? Is this a messaging issue? Is this something with respect to inflation and the uh, image of that? Is this something else? Is it just sort of a, a lack of a clear kind of policy going forward? I'm not sure what the answer is. The Federal Reserve is going to want to stay clear of this whole conversation. I think we should all be clear about that. At least they're going to attempt to in the minds of so many. Mark Zandi of Moody's had this to say. Our story over the weekend was brilliant on this. Here's the quote. Powell doesn't want to be Comey. As we approach the election, the bar for the Fed raising or lowering rates is probably pretty high, which makes you think maybe it's not a second half story. Perhaps this is going to be a first half story. Maybe that's the reason why they want to get it out of the way. Honestly, I just have to go to this. I was reading a number of stories about the youth vote because this, the difference between the youth vote and the rest of the population is just shocking to me. It found there was this recent Harvard Harris poll uh, that found that the majority, 79%, of college students, 18 to 24, 79% think that white people are oppressors and non-white people uh, have been oppressed. And you could say that Jews as a class, 67% are oppressors. That's according to uh, age 18 to 24. The ratio of Democrats to Republicans is about the highest among faculty at universities ever, going back to the 1800s. There are a whole host of polls with different groups both Democratic affiliation and Republican affiliation, putting this out, and it has the same kind of feeling. There is a very, very big gap that is emerging. This is the worldview that has come out of this education system in the last decade. That's it, bottom line. And you're starting to see it in measure after measure. From New York City, good morning. This equity market has been absolutely flying. Seven weeks of gains on the S&P 500. 
that winning streak could become eight. On the S&P right now, equity futures are just about positive by 0.2%. On the Nasdaq 100, up by 0.1%. Since the end of October, the S&P is higher by more than 12%. The banks, the financials on the S&P 500 are up by more than 20. The regional banks, some of those on the Russell, Lisa, they're absolutely flying. And you raise this question, are rate cuts good for banks or are they bad for banks? Apparently they're good for bank stocks now. They're good for bank stocks because they're taking a tail risk off the table or because they're coming in response to a tail risk? The latter, not the former. Okay. Well, these are sort of the questions that we have to ask to understand the logic behind some of the investment decisions. Or is it just sort of a FOMO, you know, lean in and feel good? These names got absolutely beaten up by the rate shock at the start of the year. There was a big worry about what they were carrying a big worry about what it would mean for their future. We were talking about existential crisis type stuff and now rates have come down. But I'm with you. Rates is an important question. If you sit down with me at the start of 2023, I think we're all saying higher rates, steeper curves, great for banks. Now I don't know anymore going into 2024. Especially because a lot of the landscape has changed. And I really, I would like to understand a little bit better the buy now, pay later, how much of the consumer debt is moving to alternative methods of financing away from the banks that haven't been as quick to lend in an environment where they have such big portfolios of treasuries and have been hampered by these concerns. But we've seen the private, private uh, investment firms take over a lot of that kind of activity. Let's turn to treasuries. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, just shaping up as follows this morning at least. Yields pretty stable, given everything we've seen over the last couple of months. We're down a couple of basis points on a two year 442 on a 10 year 390 72 i have to say lisa even with the moves we've seen you have to think about this end of cycle dynamics typically leads to a bull steepener which means the front end of the curve rallies rallies hard starts the price in a rate cutting cycle haven't really seen that the two year versus the 10 year is negative 50 something basis points Priya Misra of JP Morgan talked about this, and I think it's important. The difference between easing and normalizing, with a focus on real rates here. For the market at the moment, I think that is a, a distinction without a difference. For the Federal Reserve, I think it's increasingly important. We're talking about maybe cutting in line with the fall we've seen with inflation, but perhaps staying above what might be considered neutral. Now, with that in mind, you have to think about maybe the curve responding differently to what you would expect if it was end of cycle aggressive cuts. It also implies there is a longer time frame with which this Fed is comfortable with getting inflation under control. They're going to extend the process. They're not as worried about getting it under control as quickly as possible. And rather, they're more prioritizing the soft landing and let it go for a long time. We've got a great guest on this conversation coming up in just a moment, so sit tight. Under Savannah's this morning, Israel pushing back against calls for a ceasefire in its war with Hamas. The foreign minister saying ending the fight would be a, quote, prize for terrorism. Israel facing increasing pressure with UK and German officials urging for a, quote, sustainable ceasefire, followed by the French foreign minister calling for, Lisa, what they're calling an immediate and durable truce. And a lot of this has to do also with Hamas putting down their arms, right? So there's a lot of questions, but you raised something really important recently, which is uh, that there's a lot of disagreement within Israel itself and that Netanyahu is not a popular president right now and has some, uh, you know, particular views that are really polarizing uh, a lot of the population, particularly because people want the hostages to come home. And they want them to come home alive, not dead, the way that a number of bodies have been coming home. And so this is some of the tension bubbling under the surface at a time where everybody wants to see aid get into people and families that are living in horrific situations in Gaza. We're starting to see the business consequences come to the surface as well. This from BP this morning, pausing all oil tanker transits through the Red Sea. The announcement following an escalation of attacks on merchant shipping companies by Houthi militants. Mesk making a similar announcement on Friday. Important always to quote the fact that 12% of global trade depends on the Suez Canal. And that journey, Lisa, is going to get longer unless they address this and address it quickly. To me, this is a massive issue and it's something that has legs and potentially could really have consequences, not only because of the shipping and the potential supply chain disruptions that we thought were behind us, but also does the U.S. get directly involved? Do they send aircraft carriers over to the region? Who do they work with? How do you get on the side of different factions that are uh, definitely at odds? These are all real questions at a time where there are two other fronts to this conflict yeah. uh, that are going on right now in the world. Less serious story. Have you got a drink ready? I do.
drinking game, you know the buzzword, yep. push back, mm. push back. Fed officials pushing back on rate cut talks run out of early next year. Because of it. New York Fed President John Williams speaking to CNBC, saying those discussions are, quote, premature. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic speaking with Reuters, saying cuts won't start until the third quarter of 24. And Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester this morning, warning the markets are a bit ahead of themselves. In an interview with the Financial Times at Colby Smith, here's the quote, markets jump to the end part, which is we're going to normalise quickly. And I don't see it that way. Lisa, that's sufficient for you? Well, it's not sufficient for the market. I think it doesn't matter whether it's sufficient for me. I think that there's this issue of what would it take for them not to cut rates at this point and not to cut rates in March, especially if, to your point, they want to avoid some of the political influence heading into uh, the end of the year. This, to me, is the real question. It seems like the next step's going to be a cut. So what's the threshold? And that, I think, is what's unclear. Invesco's Matt Brill joins us around a table. Should we start there, Matt? And good morning to you. Good morning. How credible is the pushback from Mester Goldsby williams after what we heard from the chair of the Federal Reserve on Wednesday? Well, I, I think Powell himself had the chance for pushback in his speech, and he didn't do it didn't at do all. Didn't do it. So to me, that was really what you needed to hear. And from now, they're going to have to push back a little bit because it has been an absolutely enormous rally here and they're pricing in a tremendous amount of cuts and the financial easing that has gone on could call into question things. But I think overall, the inflation is, is on the right path and, and, and they know it. You were bullish credit before. Are you more bullish now? <laughs> you know, I started to get a little bit, uh, a little bit weary of it. And I actually was on the show last time with Lisa. And she said, are you actually adding while everybody else is cutting right now? And I thought about it for a second. I said, well, I think 2024 is setting up really, really well. I didn't think we'd get it this quickly, though. You know, I thought there would be a lot of companies that were pushing back on, on, on borrowing because it was so expensive. They were borrowing at 65 to 7%, and they didn't want to do it. Now they're going to be borrowing at 5 to 6%, and it's a little more tolerable. But I think overall, you know, the technicals are going to be very good. We've talked about this wall of money coming out of T-bills and cash. That is absolutely going to occur. And with it, you know, fundamentals are, are very, very good. So are you more interested in investment grade or are you going even into lower rated credit because you see, you know, if there's going to be spread compression, well, you know, join the party. <laughs> I think there's a party in a lot of different places, right? So I think it's all about your, your, your risk tolerance, but certainly continue to see upgrades in 2024. I think the high yield double B market looks very good. The triple B market, the fundamentals are very, very sound. And so overall, I, I think you can go down. I think if you look, still the triple C sector is, is challenged. I think there's, there's there, it's, 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 had, it's had very good returns, but there are some landmines there. So overall, you know, I just think that there's, there's a lot of good opportunities, but where there are most is actually in the banks. In the banks. In the banks. So if you yeah. look at valuations, you know, the financials are kind of in their like 60th percentile cheap versus the industrials are at their like 10th percentile. So there's not a lot of value on spread in, in, in industrials, but there's a lot of value on yield and on spread in the banks. I'm just wondering how much this is dependent on the Fed following through with rate cuts in March. Is there sort of a feeling that if they do, this all works out? And if they don't, it kind of starts falling apart. So March is probably not that important. How many times do they cut in 2024 is. So I think just if they go in May instead of March or, you know, whatever, the summer instead of March, it matters a little bit. But I think it's, it's all about just getting that, you know, the, that signal from the Fed that they are going to be there if they need to be, um, which we didn't have before. We were worried about that last mile that the Fed was going to fight so hard for that final mile to get inflation from three to two. Now they're telling you we're going to get there, but we'll do it at our own pace and we're not going to wreck the economy in order to do it. And I think from a banking standpoint, that's very good because they were probably going to take the brunt of it if the Fed really did push for that final mile. You've touched on this a little bit. Let's build on it. You talked about that wall of money. Can we talk about that wall of supply? What's going on with that wall of supply? So the wall of supply, you know, there, there, there actually is a fair amount of, of, of securities coming due this year um, in the investment grade market as well as high yield. But a lot of companies have elected to simply roll that or not roll that debt and actually just pay it down with cash. So because it's, because it's expensive to borrow, uh, you're seeing less debt. So net debt issuance in IG in 2024 is going to be the lowest it's been in, in like five years. So that's a huge technical positive. Now, if rates get low enough that more companies want to borrow, that'll be a little bit of an offset to that. But we are projected to see a significant decrease and net supply. Uh, 2025 is kind of when it starts to pick up a little bit more, so we're kind of looking out towards that. But overall, one company that I'm watching for the signal, if you want a signal to keep on your radar, is Microsoft. They bought, they bought Activision for 70 plus billion dollars. They didn't borrow a dime from the investment grade market. They borrowed like 30 or 40 billion from commercial paper. They have not termed it out at all because it's too expensive. If Microsoft taps the market, they're telling you we no longer think it's that expensive, that means you're going to see a lot more supply coming. We've seen equity finance deals elsewhere in M&A as well. Is that supportive of what we've seen in credit? Has the approach 
to the credit market change because of where rates are currently? I think so. So the, a lot of the, the first two big M&A deals in the energy space, the Exxon and the Chevron, were both equity financed. You just had Occidental, though, say that they're going to be borrowing to, to do their, new, their recent M&A deal. So it, we're, we're seeing a little bit of a balance there, but, but overall, when debt is expensive, people want to borrow less, and, or they should want to borrow less, and so far we've seen that. I'd be concerned if we start to see a, the trend move the other way and people just say, you know what, 5.5% is not that bad, because for a while there, they would have been kicking and screaming at 5.5%, but when you got to 65 to 7, you know, it doesn't look as bad anymore. I can't believe Tom's not here. He's been asking everybody, every credit person who comes on, when are big tech going to start issuing bonds? <laughs> Literally every single person, he's not here today. And you're like, well, watch for Microsoft to start issuing bonds. He's probably uh, watching and incredibly excited. So you think that could unleash a significant amount of supply that could maybe be not as positive. I, I, it would be a signal to me. I'm not expecting it, but if I do see that, you know, Meta did borrow. Look at the coupons on a lot of these deals. You look at Google, they've got two coupons. You look at 2% coupons. You look at Meta, they're at like 4% coupons. Nobody in the tech world issued at 5, 6, 7%. If you start to see anybody issuing at 5, it tells you that the, the high quality company that has cash is no longer thinking it's that prohibitive. But again, we haven't seen it yet, but that's the signal we're waiting for. Has there been a bias to shorter dated maturities? Absolutely. So there have been about 15% of 30-year debt has been, or of debt has been in 30-year securities or, or longer. Historically, that, that it had been as high as 30% just a few years ago. So companies did not want to borrow at these rates for a long time. Everybody forgets comp companies cannot prepay this debt. It's not like your mortgage, you can just refinance it and say, you know what, I borrowed for 30 years, the rates have gone down, I'll roll it right into a new lower rate. They have to be stuck with that for a very, very long time. So companies don't want to borrow at these rates, and a lot of pension plans and insurance companies are really starting to step into the market. And they have been for the last six months. Retail is finally getting on board, but it's really been the pension insurance company has been buying the long end, and that's been flattening credit curves. Well, this is what I wanted to ask you. Help me. I'm in cash. I'm asking this for TK. I'm in cash, and I need to deploy some of it. Where do I go? What are you telling people? Well, it's been a good trade, is what we keep telling people. But until recently, That's until the last thing. month, you know, we always have to say it's been a good trade, but you got to find the next good trade. And I think it's a kind of do you need to crawl before you can walk? You know, if, you, if, you, if that's the case, you got to go two, three years. Two to three year corporate debt is, is really attractive, particularly in the high yield market. That is getting gobbled up. We think that that's going to just completely collapse here. Two to three year debt is very, very safe, but go out to five to six year debt. If you like, six, if you like the rate for six months, you ought to like it for six years. There you go, Bramo, bottom line. If you like it for six, you should like it for six years. That sounds like you've given that speech before a couple <laughs> times. That sounded very I imagine prepared. that's what the call is like with clients at the moment. Pretty much every on single one. reinvestment risk. Exactly. Better from Priya Misra too at JP Morgan. You've got to crawl before you walk. If you want short dated, you've got some nice stuff. There then you go. Then you can push further. Just kind of counseling people exactly. into taking additional and no one risk. Feels like therapy. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kicker. Matt, thank you, buddy. It's great to see you. Matt Brill there of Invesco. If you're just joining us, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 looks like this, positive by 0.2%. Yield to go in absolutely nowhere, 390.90 on a US 10-year. Tons of Fed speak, a sprinkle of data. That's your week ahead, but for many, Lisa, for many, it's year over. It has been year over uh, for a while, but honestly, things can happen, right? I mean, the pushback could matter if suddenly we get a data print that confirms it. We get core PCE on Friday. The Bank of Japan, suddenly no one cares about the Bank of Japan anymore. That's that's tomorrow. We've got a rate decision. What if they just abandon negative rates? They surprise everyone. They throw in the towel. I have to say, if the data worsens, and I mean really worsens, you get that ugly payroll sprint, that's where you have a different conversation. Premier Minister JP Morgan was right to say that this market is pricing normalization. Rates coming back to what the Fed might perceive as being neutral, somewhere in that range. We're not talking about end of cycle. We're not talking about recession and aggressive rate cuts off the back of bad data. Quite the opposite. The hope, the dream is that the economic output, the economy remains OK. Inflation continues to come down and this Federal Reserve can cut interest rates in line with that progress. And we heard that from Steve Chivarone, the idea that even if we get a sort of softer session, profits can still hang in there. Companies can still do OK because consumers keep spending. If something shifts that narrative, that could make a real big difference. That right there is the dream. The problem is the price of that dream is getting more and more expensive as each week passes us by. This morning, stocks are up by 0.2% on the S&P. On the conflict in the Middle East, up next is Elliot Ackerman, US Marine veteran on the latest in that war. From New York City, this is Bloomberg.
let's start with the borders. Sure. Do you okay. think there's going to be a deal before the new year? Uh, no, I think uh, this will go into next year. According to the FBI director, since October the 7th, uh, jihadist groups want to attack us because we're helping Israel. I've never been more worried about a 9-11 than I am right now, and our border has been obliterated. I will not help Ukraine, Taiwan, or Israel until we secure a border that's been obliterated. That was Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina speaking on NBC over the weekend as the White House and Senate worked to secure a deal on the border with supplemental aid to Ukraine and Israel. This is important for obvious reasons, but politically speaking, Bramo, just looking at the polling, number one issue for the Republicans right now, economy, in line with Democrats, where you see the split the southern border. That is a very close second, according to a Fox poll over the weekend, as a number two issue for Republican voters. Which is a reason why this is the main sticking point to getting aid. It's also interesting, though, there are a growing number of Democrats who are getting on board with it. But again, I go to that schism in the Democratic Party, because does Joe Biden lean into some sort of deal at the risk of angering the Progressive Party, which he needs to win the general election, or at least win the, uh, the primaries. Well, the questions around the two wars, Lisa, we know the obvious factions right now. You've got Democrats questioning aid to Israel. You've got Republicans questioning aid to Ukraine. And then you've got a push to get some border aid into the mix as well. All going into year end with two key deadlines on the horizon, one in January, another in February, to secure some kind of spending deal. And real war is being fought and people looking to understand what the strategy is. And I'm thinking in particular of Ukraine, where a lot of people are saying that Russia will have a much bigger advantage if it, Ukraine doesn't get the aid that they're asking for. Let's talk about the other war, the war between Israel and Hamas. Elliot Ackerman joins us now, the U.S. Marine Corps veteran and former White House fellow. Elliot, you've got experience of this. It's valuable to us to lean on it. So thank you for joining us again. The door to door combat that we're seeing take place in Gaza, the fog of war, so to speak, and the tragic loss of life, both civilian loss of life and what we saw in the last few days, hostages losing their lives as well. Elliot, can you talk to us about the nature of combat right now and how on earth these things happen? Well, the one thing I think is, is worth emphasizing is, uh, is, is it's very difficult to overstate how uh, chaotic this type of urban combat is, how difficult it is in certain situations to know exactly what's going on. Um, so obviously, you know, this incident where these three hostages were killed um, is, a, is, is a tragedy. Um, you know, it's important to also just bear in mind the context in which it's happening, in which these Israeli soldiers have now been fighting for weeks, house to house, room to room in Gaza. Um, you know, I fought in the, the Fallujah battle in 2004, and uh, oftentimes, you know, it can be difficult in the heat of the moment to know, you know, who's a friend, who's a foe, even when someone would be appear uh, to be surrendering. Um, I actually have a friend of mine, uh, Dan Malcolm. I, I wear a bracelet for him. I've worn this bracelet for 20 years. And he was on a rooftop, and about 30 minutes before he was shot dead by a sniper, uh, a group of individuals who we thought were civilians looked like they were trying to surrender. In fact, they weren't civilians. They were insur insurgents posing as civilians. They were trying to surrender so they could figure out where our positions were. Now, this doesn't excuse what happened in Israel, but I hope it just gives a little bit of a context for the types of conditions these soldiers are dealing with. As you know, Elliot, in the court of public opinion, accidents don't seem to mean anything. It's the loss of life that is important. Elliot, there is pressure building to end this war and quickly. And what we often hear about is time. How much longer can it go on for? I think you draw a really important distinction between time-based policy and condition-based strategy on the ground. Why is that so important, particularly for this conflict and for where this administration in America stands on it? Well, I think we've seen in the past that this administration has gotten itself in, in trouble when it's leaned on times-based conditions. And I'm speaking specifically of Afghanistan, uh, you know, when we, we, we pulled up on, on a calendar that might have not making sense on the ground. Uh, and I think in the case of Israel, uh, you know, if the objective of the Israeli government, as they've stated, is the destruction of Hamas. If you pull out before that job is done, um, you know, it's basically analogous of, you know, if you had cancer finishing your chemotherapy when you've only got 95 percent of the cancer, it's going to metastasize and grow again. So uh, in my old business, the military business, we had a saying, which is you don't ever want a gentle surgeon. Uh, when you will go in to get these jobs done, you got to get the whole job done. Uh, and you don't necessarily want to do it gently because you can wind up causing more damage than if you just get it done decisively. So uh, and I'd also just point out, it's sort of strange to see this juxtaposition of 
of needing the speed and needing this finish and demanding that it be finished within days and weeks in Israel, while seeing sort of a willingness to allow the war in Ukraine to kind of just drag in year over year over year. Um, so I think it's important to also keep those two in our minds. Is Lloyd Austin a gentle surgeon? I don't think Lloyd Austin individual necessarily is a gentle surgeon, but I think what the administration is calling for by uh, saying, let's just finish this in this pressure campaign is basically asking Israel to engage in gentle surgery. Um, I don't think Israel is going to, frankly. Um, I think that there is a level of resolve there that we can't completely appreciate in the United States. But I think there is a danger there that if they were to end this fight right now, um, when it's mostly done, but not all the way done, that this would just wind up being an even worse conflict because they're going to start fighting it again, you know, months or years down the road, down the road. Elliot, you're one of the, the best voices we could talk to because you can appreciate what it is in a region like that that is engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat and that has been going on for a while. The civilians, and this is sort of one of the big fears, is that the humanitarian crisis is getting incredibly difficult to deal with and you cannot get aid in if there is active combat. Is there any corollary to this moment where there could be some way of assisting civilians while continuing uh, the campaign that you see Israel comp continuing? Well, you know, I mean, this gets down to the particulars on the ground. You know, what areas are safe? Are there areas that the Israelis feel they've sufficiently cleared out of Hamas fighters where they could allow civilians to come back into those areas and get aid to them? Um, and, you know, hopefully we can start to maybe see something like that uh, where Israel uh, has areas that they feel they can control. Um, but, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, they shouldn't be forced to do that before they're ready to do it. Uh, at the risk of having to go fight this fight all over again because Hamas is a determined adversary. You know, we've seen that. We've seen now the images of these tunnels that are wide enough to drive cars through. You know, Hamas is determined to destroy Israel. Uh, and Israel, I think, appropriately is determined to defend itself and make sure that that can never happen. I mean, if you look at financial markets, it's as if nothing's really happening. I think there is a belief from investors that this conflict will remain contained. And yet there are some cracks in that theory when you start to see attacks come from Houthi militants on foreign shipping companies and foreign shipping companies start to think about pausing the use of the Suez Canal. I just wonder, Elliot, how convinced you are that this particular conflict will be contained to where it's playing out right now? You know, it's less that I'm convinced that the conflict will in all cases be contained. And we've seen that it hasn't necessarily been contained. Right? We've seen attacks on U.S. troops in Syria and Iraq uh, from Iranian militants. But I think what probably gives individuals confidence and gives me confidence is that if it starts to really overflow into areas that are problematic, um, the United States and its allies have the capacity to quickly contain the conflict, that the U.S. Navy goes up against uh, some vessels from Houthi rebel groups, the U.S. Navy is going to win. Um, but, you know, we don't want it to get to that point. And I think uh, in addition to what's going on in Israel, the U.S. Department of Defense and the Biden administration is very, very closely watching these other events in the region. Just quickly, Elliot, how much does it change the game that this is essentially the first war that's been live streamed? Well, I think... Um, and so much as tactical decisions, things that happen, you know, on the ground are immediately projected out to the entire world and have strategic implications. And we, we saw that recently with the uh, deaths of these three hostages. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen that, but not only in Israel. I mean, we've also seen that Ukraine is a war um, that uh, has been a social media war, as was Afghanistan. Um, and so really in the last handful of years, the political calculus of war has changed because, as you just put, you know, these wars are live streamed, they're run over social media, and we all experience them. Elliot, thank you for the update. We appreciate it, sir. as always. Elliot Ackman then, leading on his, leading on his personal experience in, in Iraq and elsewhere, Lisa, just incredibly difficult door-to-door -door combat and the accidents that can happen. If you think about the objective, the objective hasn't changed, destroy Hamas. Where there is massive disagreement, the means to achieve that objective because of the tragic loss of life we've seen over the last few months. I talk about social media and I talk about the idea that the images are streamed because it does change uh, the political calculus and it does change the sort of groundswell of opinion. If this had been fought 20 years ago, do you think that you would have the same kind of feelings? What wars are shown more than others? There are a lot of things like that that are going on and the, the court of public opinion is one that seems to be a pretty significant one for Hamas.
and it's sort of a question of how you deal with that. I couldn't agree more. Coming up on the market, Mira Panda to JP Morgan Asset Management joining us on this rip-roaring rally of the last two months. Your equity market positive here by 0.2%. Yields in a bond market just a touch lower. Your 10-year, 390.53. From New York City, pushback. What pushback? This is Bloomberg. There's so much optimism in the markets right now. We've always counted on markets overreacting. It seems like the market's in for a bit of a consolidation here. We are in an environment where there is less rate sensitivity. For the here and now to the year end, look, I think 4,800 is a real scenario here. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The bears have been absolutely crushed over the last two months. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market positive by a quarter of 1% on the S&P on a seven-week winning streak on the S&P 500. The longest weekly winning streak going back to November 2017. For financial markets, Christmas started at the end of October. I thought you were going to say, let's get you to the weekend, because it kind of feels like people are ready for it to just go away at this point. Honestly, we're looking at a situation where we're seeing the longest rally since, what, 2017 in the S&P. We're seeing new all-time highs in the NASDAQ. People are feeling euphoric around every asset class. Where is the pushback to really create the feeling that the bears are even heard? I mean, just, to, I'm sorry, forgive me, but think a prayer for the bears that have been blown out of the positions and aren't going to really restart it. Does that mean that there's sort of this downside risk, that there isn't that contrary hey, voice down. in it? What bears? My Wilson, Morgan Stanley, he sounds bullish this morning. Who's left? What bears are left? That's my point. If you don't have any bears left, don't you have a problem on your hands? You Arguably, need the bears. the bar is very high now going into 2024. So let's talk about the bet. Inflation comes down. Growth is still OK. And this Fed is cutting rates and earnings rebound. Is that right? Is that the bet into next year? Basically. And we heard from Jay Pulaski. We might get some turmoil. People are talking about, you know, some sort of uh, top off, uh, you know, blow up of the off the top for a little bit. But everyone's talking about buying the dip. I and mean, this is what we heard earlier this year, right? That basically any dip is a viable dip. And then we didn't get a dip. Is that going to be the same kind of repeat that we get next year? And never mind getting to the weekend. Let's get to the year end. If you've put out a price target a month ago, wow, it's painful. David Koss and the Goldman Sachs out first, revising the call for next year that he'd only made a month ago on the S&P 500. They go from 4,700 to 5,100. I keep saying it. We've had next year's gains in two months for many of these houses, many of these banks. And they see no reason for it to stop. And I think that's the important thing. Some people are saying, including Julian Emanuel uh, of Evercore ISI, who came out and said, you know, we don't think you're going to get that big of a gain through year end. It's going to be choppy. But other people are saying, what's to stop it? If we don't get a hard landing and if the Fed has shown a willingness to normalize or surgically cut or whatever you want to call it, rates go why, lower. Why the fingers? You're not buying it. The bottom line is this. If the Fed has stopped hiking rates, period, full stop. If the Fed is prepared to cut rates, period, full stop. You know, they can maybe not make the period full stop, but they're, you know, essentially they're preparing to cut rates. Then what's to stop this feeling that they're on your side if you're a market participant? Well, you just keep ignoring them, don't you? The Goresby is trying to push back. Mester saying it's too uh, early this morning in the Financial Times. We heard from New York Fed President Williams on Friday doing the same thing. What strikes me, Lisa, is the selective hearing of this bond market and financial markets that we've heard now for more than a month. When you get the pushback, brush it to one side. If you see any sign of encouragement, grip it really tightly. Because when we start to think about what's going to happen with inflation, let's go back to Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro. They are still saying if, if this continues, we can consider doing this. It's just that for Neil and many other people, they don't think that if is that large. They think the disinflation in the pipeline we're going to see come to the surface over the next several months, and they'll be in a position maybe as early as March to be cutting interest rates. That's well said. And I will just say this. The thing that changed over those 12 days between Jay Powell's one speech and the other one that sounded very different was disinflation data that came out strongly showing that price pressures were uh, alleviating. To me, one of the biggest reasons why I'm so focused on this Red Sea issue and the shipping containers that are uh, not going through that particular area is that these are the kinds of... Uh, uh, exogenous risks that might have a bigger impact than some of the other knowns that are baked in. Because right now we do see disinflation. The Fed is responding to it in a way they find appropriate. Maybe they feel confident enough to come out and just call it transitory. You know, just say 
the T word. Go ahead. About the shipping canal. Yeah. yeah. All that stuff. Okay. <laughs> Here are the scores. They're trying to push back. It's not stopping this rally. Mm -hmm. Your equity market looks like this on the S&P 500, positive by a quarter of 1%. Yield to doing nothing. 390. 90 on a 10-year in foreign exchange the euro just a touch stronger against the weaker dollar 109.19 on that currency pair positive by 0.2 percent with us around the table is mira panda the global market strategist at jp morgan asset management morning mira a 2024 economy that's what you're looking for. What is a 2024 economy? So a 2024 economy in 2024 is 2% growth, zero recessions, 2% inflation, and 4% unemployment. And the way we get to this relatively benign outlook is from a growth perspective, we've had five consecutive quarters of above trend growth. Right now we're tracking for potentially six if we look at how some of the numbers are playing out for the fourth quarter. So really getting to a normalization of trend 2%. If you look at inflation, we're seeing that shelter is still the lion's share that's left over. It is starting to decelerate slowly but surely. We're seeing some measures in the real economy that indicate that. You've seen core goods deflation for six months in a row. Gas prices are coming down. Um, it's true that the consumer is experiencing headwinds. Lending conditions are tight. Rates are high. So recession risk is not entirely off the table, but it is not our base case. And those things together we don't necessarily think can push us into recession itself. Aren't you describing the pre-pandemic economy? Is that what we're going back to? Exactly. If you look at a lot of dynamics that we're seeing today, it looks a bit like 2019. Look at the unemployment rate. Look at the level of job gains that we've been seeing. Uh, even if you look at job openings kind of heading towards that type of labor market. So what we are definitely seeing is something that looks like post-pandemic normalization still to get back to a regular economy next year. Stock prices aren't pre-pandemic prices, though. So how much can you say that this hasn't been baked in already and that there's that much more room to run? I think that's a good point because while our economic outlook is relatively benign, I think we want to temper expectations a little bit around the equity market given what we've already seen. I mean, we never want to hate a rally, and I feel like this rally has been, uh, causes some reluctance, except for now, because we have finally completed the trifecta of upside surprises. You saw an avoidance of a recession, and that, in fact, we saw a recent acceleration in growth. We've seen inflation come closer to the Fed's 2% target. And now the Fed has finally acknowledged, not only did we pause, but we're also thinking about cuts. Okay, pause. Does it concern you there are no bears left? You said until now. Suddenly we've got the euphoria. The bears have been, you know, shaken up, put to the side, shamed, you know, rejected. Isn't that concerning, given the fact that you want a certain degree of uh, naysayers, of dissent? Here's the bear case going into next year. And again, I wouldn't say we're overly bearish given our economic outlook. We still think we could see single digit returns. But compared to some of the other estimates across the street, I think there's three things that we have to think about for the equity market next year. One, there's not a lot of catalysts for the rest of the year, but when we come back into January and we start to hear from CEOs again, even at 5% growth, CEOs in the third quarter were saying, we're seeing a gloomier outlook, we're going to see some constraints on revenues. So I think you'll continue to hear that in January. That'll throw a little bit of cold water on the rally. Um, two, we've seen an extraordinary amount of rate volatility this year, but an extraordinary underwhelming amount of equity market volatility. So perhaps those start to meet in the middle a little bit. Um, and then the multiple. Simply, we've had this macro hyped multiple expansion. So we could start to see as the micro stories bleed in a little bit more that, OK, we have all the good macro news behind us. How does the micro play out in 2024? The character of the rally has changed. I think we should be open and clear about that. Tech was ripping, leading for a long time. Starting to see it broaden out. Is that something to hold on to? In some ways. I mean, I think if we, we consider the macro environment and what can help next year, if you have inflation that is decelerating and rates that are coming down, that tends to be good for growth. We want to be a little bit cautious around the Magnificent Seven, given the rally there, given the 40% overvaluation there of those stocks relative to history. Uh, you know, it's about a, a third of the index if you look at the top 10 stocks, but only about 20% of the profits. People think all the profits are coming from the MAG-7. There are other sources of profitability. So I do think we, we think a little bit about the broadening. On the macro side, look, there's still some support for growth in general, because again, falling rates, uh, falling inflation, and you do see with a lot of these growthier companies, ample cash on balance sheets to, to deploy that's also earning interest. Uh, and you also see that there's still growth versus value, more spending on things like R&D and CapEx, so that future growth will hopefully be achieved. But I do think you've seen so many other areas of the market that are beaten down because their value or their cyclical and the macro uh, tailwinds are not there for them. But certainly the valuation tailwinds are there. And if you look underneath the surface, there's still a lot of quality 
in those sectors that I think that, that there is to be had for investors. That sectors, let's talk about size and geography. Small caps have started to participate in a bigger way, seeing record highs in France, Germany, over in Europe. Talk to us about international just a little bit more. Constructive or not? Constructive because you're finally seeing some progress from a dollar perspective. Um, and it does sound like if the Fed pauses and starts to cut before the ECB and, and the ECB wants to hold on a little bit longer before they, they do start cutting, that's going to provide additional tailwind for the dollar. So from a U.S. investor standpoint, that is a benefit. What we have to think about a little bit as a countervailing force and as a floor to the dollar is the fact that growth differentials in the U.S. versus outside the U.S. are still likely to favor the U.S. itself. But certainly that that remit is, is broadening out when we think about the attractiveness of international stocks in places like India, continued rally in Japan, um, perhaps in favor of areas like Europe and, and China, which could see a sentiment rally, but is still dealing with some, some deep-seated issues. Given the underperformance, I mean, I was looking at the fact that the Magnificent Seven had a 75% rally so far this year, and account for, as you said, about a third of the S&P 500. Do you expect these stocks to actually underperform and for the S&P to underperform next year simply because they don't have that much more room to go? It's possible, but that prognostication is made many times of what will stop these stocks. And again, the macro environment is relatively supportive if you think about where growth and inflation and, uh, and rates are heading. So I, I wouldn't bet against them, but I would diversify around them to a greater extent. Strip out the MAG7 S&P 500 really hasn't done that much compared to when you have it in. 12%, I believe, something yep. like that. I mean, we're looking at uh, laggards that have still gained, but just have lagged behind to such a degree. And then you take a look at some of the small caps. And every year, everyone says, those underperformed. Yeah, this is, this is the this moment. This is the moment. This is the moment. We've seen a relief rally, I would say. Would you call it that in a financial? Is a relief rally off the back of what's happened in the bond market? What do I need to see for that to continue? I'd say you'd certainly seen a relief rally in, in other areas outside the MAG7, outside growth. You bring up small cap. I do want to highlight that we're a little bit cautious on small cap. Why is and that? that's a bit more of a relief. One, um, if you do have an economy that is slowing, even if it's positive, but we're coming down from above trend growth, that's not necessarily great for a lot of these very domestically levered companies. And also, if you think about some of the debt dynamics, it's great to see cuts, but we're still going to be at policy rates above 4%. And in that environment, you want to think about the nature of how these companies have taken on debt. In the Russell 2000, about 38% of the index is floating rate. In the S&P 500, that's about 7%. In the S&P 500, about 49% of debt is termed out beyond 2030. That's about 14% in the Russell. So this higher for longer, even if it's not as high for as long as we thought, um, it's still at the baseline that we're going to be operating in next year could be a little bit tr troubling for debt service. This goes back to the conversation of this morning, the difference between cutting rates and easing policy. Mira, love it. Great to catch up. Mira Pandit there of JP Morgan Asset Management. Here's the market for you. The scores, if you are just joining us, positive on the S&P by 0.2%. Yields just about unchanged on a 10-year 391.27. The conversation, without a doubt, is on rate cuts next year. And the difference, Lisa, this morning between cutting interest rates and easing policy. We heard from Priya Misra of JP Morgan Asset Management this morning saying that this was about normalizing. That's the word you should be thinking about right now. Which is actually the best case scenario for risk assets because it means that they're cutting rates simply in response to uh, inflation coming down, not in response to actual economic pain. That's really the question. If they're cutting to stimulate, that creates something else. I do want to bring this to you. Dick Bove uh, of Odeon Capital writing in explaining why banks benefit from rate declines, talking about how uh, there is an increase in real equity increase in leveraging capacity, and an increase in secular earnings growth. So basically why rate cuts can be good, lower rates for banks. For banks. New regime. Yeah, exactly. New regime. Until it's not Smart anymore. take, yeah, precisely, precisely. There's, you know, a, a, a like glide path. Yeah. Coming up very shortly, Bill Dudley of Bloomberg Opinion, former New York Fed president, on his latest column. The headline, Jerome Powell's pivot is a pretty big gamble. We'll talk about that pretty big gamble in just a moment. From New York City this morning, stocks are higher. They always are these days, aren't they? Good morning. Twenty twenty three looks like it's going to end up being a very substantial reduction in inflation without a big increase in the unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. That's the golden path that I talked about. 
but we're still above the target. I still caution everybody, it's not done. And so the data is going to drive what's going to happen to rates. For sure, it's too early to declare victory. I'm not sure if that was for us, the market, or for the chairman himself. That was Chicago Fed President Austin Gorsby warning the inflation fight isn't over. Speaking to CBS over the weekend, joining a chorus of Fed officials pushing back on rate cut speculation in the wake of Jay Powell's dovish outlook. Former New York Fed President Bill Dudley calling Powell's comments a gamble, warning, quote, there's plenty that can go wrong. Powell has repeatedly emphasized that the Fed must finish the job. Yet the more weight he puts on cutting rates to avoid a recession, the greater the risk of falling and failing to control inflation of markets getting a big unpleasant surprise one way or another 2024 promises to be an interesting year thanks for teeing that up bill let's start the conversation there just why do you think that is so risky and what on earth happened at the news conference last week we spoke immediately afterwards you've had an extra week what was that bill I think he's been very pleased with how, how the economy has performed to be had pretty sturdy growth yet uh, the inflation rate has come down uh, so the prospects of a soft landing have gone up. I think that's all really good and positive. What I don't understand is why you'd want to add fuel to the fire and cause financial conditions to ease uh, substantially, which is what he what he provoked last last week. So stocks are up quite a bit. Uh, bond yields are down. Financial conditions are much more accommodative. The Goldman Sachs Financial Condition Index, for example, is eased by a full percentage point uh, at a time that the economy has been growing at an above trend pace. So to me, it's I worry that the Fed's not going to finish the job. Uh, he's behaving a little bit more like Arthur Burns than he is like Paul Volcker. <laughs> Bill, let's build on that just a touch more. Do you think he's seduced by the prospect of Ned and the soft landing? Do you think that's what sucked him in a little bit? Well, I think that's certainly what he's trying to achieve. And if I was in his shoes, I would do the same. I think there, there's sort of a contest going on right now between how to think about monetary policy. Is policy really tight because real rates are high and inflation's coming down? Or is policy not so tight because financial conditions have eased significantly and that's providing support to the economy? If you look at the Atlanta Fed GDP now, uh, as for the fourth quarter, it's now tracking 2.6% after a 5.2% growth rate in the third quarter. So it's not really clear that the economy needs a lot more accommodation to support itself. Bill, do you think the Fed Chair Jay Powell understood what he was going to do to markets? I think that he certainly, I hope he understood that he was coming across with a very optimistic sort of framework for the markets to digest. Um, I think that it's true, as Austin Goolsby said a little bit, little bit earlier, uh, that this is a forecast. And so if the forecast doesn't materialize and the Fed rate cuts that are promised won't materialize either. So the market may be getting a little bit ahead of itself. This is how Powell thinks the world is going to evolve. Uh, the Fed, Powell thinks the Fed's going to be cutting rates in 2024. But it's possible that the economy could be firmer for longer, inflation could be more stubborn, and the rate cuts might not actually turn out to materialize. The reason why I ask that is because Fed Chair Powell had an opportunity to push back against the financial conditions and the easing that we have seen. He had a chance to say, this is problematic and moves counter to our goal of bringing inflation down. He didn't. And you're saying financial conditions still matter. So why do they still matter? Is it becoming inflationary or at least uh, not necessarily restrictive in a way that's problematic for the Fed to see financial conditions easing as much as you've pointed out they have? Well, the big problem here is that if financial conditions ease a lot, that provides impetus to economic growth. If the economy grows faster, the labor market's tighter, wage inflation's higher, and then it's make harder to actually achieve your 2% inflation objective. So the question is, does the economy need more fuel? Does the economy need to grow faster? I would say probably no. The labor market is already very, very tight. Wage inflation, as Paul has acknowledged, is above a level consistent with 2% inflation. So I'm not sure why you'd want to put more fuel on the fire. Bill, do you think we've learned enough about the cycle so far, though, to draw conclusions about the contribution of the labor market to overall price pressure and just discount it and say it's not as important as we thought it was? Well, I think it's true that there's a big labor force supply uh, benefit that you got last year. A lot of people rejoined the labor force. So the Fed got sort of had, it, had its cake and eat it too. They had pretty sturdy growth, but it didn't generate inflation pressure because the labor force expanded uh, to accommodate that growth. Now, the question is, is that going to continue in 2024? Uh, that's, a good, that's, a, that's a really important question in the economic outlook. Are we going to continue to see that kind of rapid labor force growth that accommodates payroll gains of 150, 175,000, 200,000 a month. Do you see reason to believe that it won't? I think that, that there's some reason to believe that some of the labor force growth we saw last year was a catch-up 
right? You know, basically, you, you 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 opened up immigration again, so you had a surge of immigration of legal, of legal immigration into the U.S. last year. Uh, work from home allowed uh, uh, working age women to to re-enter the labor force, but whether that trend is going to continue at that pace, I would be. Bit, bit skeptical about that. There seems to be an acceptance or reacceptance of the concept of transitory at Fed Chair, uh, among uh, the Fed officials, particularly Fed Chair Jay Powell. Are you pushing back on that? Are you saying it's still too early to say that there's still stickier aspects to inflation that they're discounting? I think a lot of the inflation pressure clearly was transitory. A lot of the upward pressure you saw in goods prices was just due to the pandemic and people increasing their demand for goods temporarily during that shutdown period. Now, when you've opened up the economy, the demand for goods falls, and so that all that price pressure goes away. I think the problem on inflation is really more about pressure on resources in the labor market. The labor market is still very, very tight. Uh, wage inflation is still too high. And if the economy grows at an above-trend pace in 2024, that all that pressure on the labor market is going to increase rather than diminish. So the real question I have in my mind is, is, is the monetary policy as tight as the, as the Fed thinks it is? And I think the fact that the Fed has pivoted in this way um, by easing financial conditions, that makes monetary policy less restrictive rather than more restrictive going forward. Some people have speculated that the Fed wants to cut rates in the first half of the year and avoid making any moves whatsoever in the second half because of the presidential election. Do you buy into that? No, I don't buy into it. I think at the end of the day, the Fed acts in a completely apolitical manner because they understand that if they start timing rate cuts or rate increases with the, with the political cycle, that politicizes the Fed and puts them in the middle of the whole debate. So the best thing the Fed can do is they totally ignore the political cycle and do what they think is best to achieve their dual mandate objectives. Let's just sit on the comments we've heard so far. We've had clarifying remarks from New York Fed President John Williams, your old seat bill, clarifying remarks from Goolsby over the weekend from Mester this morning in the Financial Times. Bill, how does that work? These speeches, these interviews are scheduled well ahead of time, as we know. Is there someone on the committee the Board of Governors that sends out a message to F1 and says, let's all get on the same page. I need you to say X, Y, C, Bill. Does that ever happen? So the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, uh, John Williams, when John Williams speaks, you have to believe that that's been carefully choreographed with the Board of Governors and Jay Powell. When other Fed presidents speak, no, that's not choreographed. That's them operating on their own. So uh, Powell speaks, uh, you want to pay, uh, Powell speaks, you want to pay attention. John Williams speaks, you want to pay attention because they're part of the Troika, the core group it sets monetary policy for the Fed. So I think, look, I think I think people are pushing back a little bit. Uh, they think the market is sort of running away uh, from them uh, when when the story isn't really completed yet. I mean, Paul's Paul's you know, remarks last week were all about how he thinks things are going to evolve. We have to see if they actually evolve in that way uh, to provide the motivation for rate cuts. Hey, Bill, appreciate the update. Great piece this morning. Enjoyed the read. Bill Dudley there of Bloomberg Opinion on the gamble he thinks this Federal Reserve is taking with the grand pivot that was seemingly unofficially announced in last week's news conference. The idea of who to listen to and how it's choreographed, if John Williams was choreographed pretty carefully, I guess they were saying, all right, can you calibrate this rally? And he's like, all right, I will. We weren't really talking if about we it. had to say we aren't really talking about it, what was the chair doing talking about it? Well, and that's the reason why nobody listened, right? But this is exactly it, that people don't know why they should listen to it if clearly they did have a conversation and it's clear that it's something in the discourse if data cooperates, yes, but you can't really put that genie back in the bottle. Let's imagine the person who's got to edit the minutes. Spare a thought. What do the minutes look like now? We didn't talk about it. We did not it. talk about it. And, and just, it's, you know, draw a line it's out. really important that we remain vigilant. Okay. The last mile, sure. pain more pain. And then we're going to sit there and say, well, where was it coming from in the news conference? I mean, I don't get it. No, we don't, don't have to even show up because okay. we already did that. Next hour on Bloomberg TV, Kate Moore of BlackRock, Jared Woodard of Bank of America, Laurie Heindel at State Street. Lots of questions on basically what was Chairman Powell doing last Wednesday and how credible is the pushback since then? Or do you just ignore it and keep on buying this equity market? Because that's what's been happening now for the last seven weeks on the S&P 500. Can you make it week eight? Equity futures up here by a quarter of 1% on the S&P. In the bond market, yields going nowhere, 3.90.90 on a 10-year. In foreign exchange, the euro, 109.21. We said it a few times already this morning, your pushback is only as credible as the data behind it. For the ECB, the data behind that pushback is absolutely terrible. From New York City, this is Bloomberg.
An hour before the New York Open, welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramo is Tom off today. John off to uh, prep for his 9 a.m. hour. And what we see is a lift to the market following seven straight weeks of gains, the longest streak since 2017. You could see that really uh, on a broad-based level. It has been led by the small caps, by the banks, by everything that got beaten up. The S&P now up about a quarter of a percent near those targets for year-end next year. Uh, Euro uh, dollar 109.24, 10 year yields up just fractionally but stable at 391. When I'm watching, Treasury has had their best weekly performance since March 2020. At what point do people start to wake up to some of the same concerns from earlier in the year, like the budget deficit, like who's going to be buying all this debt? A lot of those have been pushed aside with the wall of clash. But on the fiscal side, there still are a whole host of questions, especially leading into the end of the year and heading up for a tumultuous January. Emery Hardern back with us, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Emery, I want to get your take on what the timeline is. We do have Senate back in session trying to get a couple of things done before they go away for the holidays. A lot of key deadlines coming, though, in the next four weeks. Yeah, I mean, your guess is as good as a lot of senators at the moment, some mixed messaging over the weekend. But I think what most people are gravitating towards is that the fact that they have made some progress when it comes to this comprehensive deal for Ukraine aid in lieu of more border security and potentially also in changing some immigration uh, provisions. But the fact of the matter is, will they be able to vote on it this week? That's the big question, as Senate my Majority Leader Chuck Schumer called all the senators back to try to get a deal done this week. He said there would be a vote this week, but Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, along with James Lankford, the senator that's the main Republican negotiator in this border deal, they said that likely there will not be a vote this week in a private letter to their colleagues. So that remains to be seen potentially if we will get what Terry Haynes is calling an 80 percent chance of a deal in principle. So potentially by the end of the week, there could be an outline, a deal in principle, a negotiation. We do know the White House is stepping up efforts. We have Alejandro Mayorkas, the Homeland Security um, official, part of these negotiations over the weekend. But Lisa, could there be a vote? And then this bleeds into the new year where things get even more complicated because we have a laddered approach when it comes to potential government shutdowns. Is anyone talking about actually reducing the deficit at this point? <laughs> well, yes, people talk about it, but are they acting on it at this moment? No. Um, I mean, the House has left. Mostly it's the where the House where these kind of deals should be originating when it comes to the fiscal purse of the United States. Uh, but when it comes to the deficit, the Republicans maintain that they want to lower the deficit, which is why they want these top line numbers to be much lower going into the appropriations debates. And all of this is going to really accumulate in the first few weeks of January. The first part of that uh, laddered approach for the government, maintaining the government to be open is January 19th and then February 2nd. Um, so you're going to hear a lot, hear a lot about fiscal responsibility come the start of the new year. All of these problems are being pushed into the start of 2024. Just going back to uh, the border control issue, I just want to get your sense. What are the main contours of the disagreement between the Democrats and the Republicans and, frankly, within the parties as well? Well, it's not it's not the fact that the president of the United States has talked about having a more secure border and sending more money there. Republicans, by and large, agree on all of that. But this comes down to asylum provisions and parole provisions. So asylum, who should be granted asylum into the United States? Should those rules be tougher? And then also, once you're in the United States, how does the laws reflect the, the fact that individuals can work until they are called before a judge. So it's all about asylum. It's all about parole. And this is where the crux of the debate is at right now between the Republicans and the Democrats. But Republicans have made it very clear, Lisa, if there is no broader security package that includes provisions in asylum and in parole, then they are not going to allow for Ukraine aid to go through. Anne-Marie Hordern, thank you so much. As always, we'll be catching up with you uh, throughout the week and uh, weeks to come as we try to understand exactly how much we're going to end up with another government shutdown. Right now, markets, everyone's trying to understand just how dovish Fed Chair Jay Powell was, especially given some of the pushback we've heard from colleagues at the Fed. Kathy Bustancic, among them, chief economist at Nationwide Mutual Insurance. How much has your view, Kathy, changed since last week? Well, good morning, Lisa. 
Um, it hasn't really changed all that much, uh, to be honest. Um, we were, you know, we were expecting rate cuts to, to unfold in the middle part of the year. We have May, you know, as our exact forecast. Uh, that's always tough to tell. But we, we had the Fed funds rate going down to four and four and a quarter by the end of the year. I guess the difference for us is that we had baked in and we still do a mild recession um, that, that unfolds in the middle part of next year. Um, I think what surprised me was just how open and, and transparent Chairman Powell was. Um, doesn't surprise me they were talking to some degree about rate cuts. They, they obviously didn't go into a lot of degree. I don't, I don't think so, right? And, and the timing, they didn't discuss that. But, you know, if you look at the dot plot estimates, they, they added another rate cut for next year. Of course, that had to be somewhat discussed. But I, I was I was struck by how dovish his um, his comments were uh, that that just fed the markets. Well, a lot of people might argue that he was just being honest and transparent about what they were actually thinking about. And they didn't see an easing in financial conditions as a concern for uh, prolonging this cycle. Do you agree with that? Do you think financial conditions are less important at this point? Well, you know, I think financial conditions are very important, um, but I think what he has said in the past makes sense, at least the recent past, is we're going to have our, you know, projections, we're going to conduct the monetary policy we see best, and the markets are going to do their thing. And eventually, you know, that will be reconciled one way or the other. Um, the most recent past, it was reconciled in, in favor of the Fed, uh, but now we have the markets, you know, running far ahead. I mean, there's some risks. To that right, if, if inflation doesn't continue to uh, disinflate as expected, you know, rental inflation could be a little stickier. Um, on the other hand, you could say, well, what the financial conditions are doing does help ensure a, a soft landing, and you know, maybe that that's okay, right? Um, the, the, you know, in the timing of it, you know, whether they they cut rates in March, that does seem a bit premature to us, but. You know, towards the middle of the year seems reasonable and, and it could come in May. Let's talk about some of the potential scenarios. I'm really struck by the story about the Red Sea shipping channel that accounts for about 12 percent of uh, all container shipping, uh, shipping uh, activity in the world. I'm just wondering the blockage of this, the fact that you have more and more container companies stopping some of uh, their transit through that passageway. Are things like that on your radar? to be sort of a shock, a supply side shock that could get reinstated once again. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, we, we've, we've seen that, uh, you know, movie play before and we know that it can have a uh, large ripple effect. So uh, whether supply chains or some other exogenous shock, it certainly, um, you know, can play havoc with the expectations the markets have and, and also even the Fed Reserve. Certainly we watch that. Um, but what we have seen is really um, overall supply chains in, in much healthier shape. And, and domestic demands uh, activity is slowing. Now, we th we may not get the mild recession we're forecasting. Uh, even if you get a soft landing, you're going to have slower growth. That takes pressure off of, of inflation, especially in the goods market. And we look at China, right? China's struggling and, and, and their domestic demands weak. It looks like they're uh, pushing out their goods onto the you know global market, that only kind of reinforces um, deflation in the goods sector. So this is a reason why maybe uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell leaned in, because you are seeing this disinflation continue. The pushback, though, does continue from other Fed officials. Austin Goolsby uh, commenting uh, right now, Chicago Fed president, he's saying that he does see significant improvement on the inflation front, but was a bit surprised by the market reaction. Do you think, Kathy, that people are over their skis with the number of rate cuts that the Fed could potentially make next year? Or do you think that people are over their skis with understanding the potential pain that could come through the economy? I think both, actually. Um, I think, you know, again, we're forecasting essentially what the markets have priced in in terms of by year end uh, with the Fed funds. But that that was assuming uh, a mild recession where the unemployment rate goes up to about 5%. If the Fed is successful in pulling off the soft landing, I would make the case that you get a little less, you know, rate cuts. I would think what they forecast is more reasonable. And, and they are going to be, you know, the stronger and more resilient economic activity is, the more cautious I think they're going to be on the inflation. Yes, things are going in the right way, but the last thing they want to do is see some stalling out of inflation. We're not even talking an upward reverse, you know, reversal, um, just a stalling out. And I think economic activity, 
Listen, one thing that, you know, isn't talked about a lot is if inflation continues to go lower, as we all think, that means companies lose some pricing power and that that hurts revenue and top line unless they can make it up in volume. But if the growth is slowing, I, I don't really see that. So I think you still have some profit margin pressure, you know, as you look into 2024. Do you think that the weakness is coming from just savings being spent up, that story that people kept saying, and then we were waiting for it and waiting for it? Or do you think that we're seeing more cracks in the labor market than people really appreciate? Yeah, so I think the savings is, is largely, you know, the pandemic really is savings have been largely been spent. Uh, we did a good job of, of going through $2.1 trillion, right, as a U.S. consumer. Um, and I think if you look at the labor market, if you look at the cyclical portions, especially in the service sector, you're seeing a notable slowing. I mean, where the job gains came uh, on the service side were health and education. Um, now, that's not going to be affected by interest rates and, and cyclical as much. So if you if you strip that out, core private service jobs are down to 22,000. So I do think we're seeing a slowing. And I think the Fed maybe also sees that and wants to make sure you know, now they've gotten close, right, to possibly pulling off the soft landing. They don't, now they can get a little greedy and say, well, at one point we would have accepted a mild recession. The most important part is getting inflation out. Now they're saying, well, now we have to consider both sides of the mandate, right, employment as well. So, Is core PCE important coming out on Friday? Oh, yeah. No, I, absolutely important. I, I would say, uh, now, it, it's, we have already gotten the CPI data for November. So, there's not, there shouldn't be a huge mystery. But if it surprises, I do think that that changes things a little bit, right, in terms of the calculus. It's always important, the core PC, but I, d I don't anticipate it changing the momentum, what we're seeing in the marketplace. I think we're, you know, the bulls are out of the, in, in, in both the, the bond and, and the equity market at this point. Kathy Bastiansik of Nationwide, uh, thank you for being with us. Stay close. If you are just joining the program, we do see a lift to markets to start a potential eighth straight weeks of gains right now throughout uh, the market. You are seeing yields a little bit higher, 3.92 percent. But the S&P, after seven straight weeks of gain, 47.79, up about a quarter of a percent uh, in early trading. We are talking with Kathy Bastancic uh, of Nationwide about the different potential risk scenarios going into next year. One thing we haven't talked about is the deficit and some of the politics. Do you see that as really having any material impact on the economic outlook at a time when a lot of people have just continually, at least in the market, shrugged off all of the sort of turmoil in Washington? Well, you know, that, that could be some kind of exogenous shock on, on the political front that, that, you know, that's something, you know, there's still a lot of dysfunction there. But I think in terms of the fiscal front, what we expect is very little, um, you know, easing in fiscal policy, even if we have a rough patch, you know, that politically is not going to happen. But also, um, you know, I think they're still trying to decide whether, you know, what, what the spending bills will be for next year. And I I do think there's pressure, especially uh, from the Republicans, to try to rein in the deficit. You know, what's not talked about as much is that really the pressure is coming from entitlement spending, which is, you know, persistent. That's that's a secular issue. And also the fact that interest rates are, are now, even though we've come off quite a bit, its interest costs are, are high. If you look at discretionary spending, that's really been squeezed I mean, year after year. That continues to be squeezed, you know, excluding the pandemic. Um, they may continue to try to squeeze that more, but um, the one area that probably doesn't get s squeezed is, is defense spending, right? I think with the multiple uh, wars going globally and the fact that we need to, you know, continuing to read, that we need to replenish our own arms, that's probably one area where we continue to see spending. Kathy Basancic of Nationwide, thank you so much. Uh, going, uh, going forward, we're going to be speaking about the situation in the Red Sea. Kevin Book of Clearview Energy Partners joining us next. So you parse through a massive corridor for everything from oil uh, to uh, container ships. This is Bloomberg. The region has not kind of been a safe area for shipping for a very, very long time. But now it's been escalating kind of beyond uh, what we've seen um, for, a, you know, at any point in time, really. So it's a huge kind of risk concern. We're afraid that it's only a question of time until uh, kind of we see a, a you know, a ship that's completely kind of unrelated 
to Israel or, or any parts of the, of the conflict uh, will be attacked. That was Lars Bowsed, uh, frontline CEO, in response to a number of the attacks in the Red Sea by Houthi militants, which has led to a host of container shipping companies, as well as the latest being BP coming out and saying they were halting their Red Sea voyages. Welcome back. Uh, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. We want to take a look, uh, in addition to the lift the market, some of the names underneath. There was this big acquisition, Nippon Steel, buying United States Steel Corp for $14.1 billion. This does create uh, the world's second largest steel company and the biggest outside of China. This raises questions about the ownership uh, and uh, whether Japan's biggest steel producer will be allowed to uh, buy U.S. steel, but also is uh, really kind of a lifeline for U.S. steel after a lot of speculation of what would happen and a lot of trouble with the finances. Those shares up by 29 percent. And BP, this is really the story that we're watching this morning. How many companies are going to stop shipping their goods through the Red Sea in response to these Houthi militant attacks. BP is the latest coming out and saying uh, that they cannot risk it. Those shares up 2 percent, almost 2 percent, 1.9 percent in tandem with oil prices that are moving higher as well. Kevin Brook, uh, Kevin Book has been covering this, trying to understand the implications. And I'm so pleased to say joins us now, co-founder of Clearview Energy Partners. Kevin, can we just start by trying to understand how important this Red Sea passage really is for shipping? Lisa, good morning. Thanks for having me. It's uh, 8% of global LNG, about 9% of global oil and petroleum products. So uh, an enormous amount of energy that goes into the world goes through the Red Sea. So what is the potential consequence if these attacks do continue? How much more time is required to ship things in alternate routes? How much more <laughs> energy will be used, uh, oil will be used for those shipping uh, routes? Is, is relatively insignificant compared to the supply impact. There's two aspects to this. The first is the uh, the additional latency introduced by going through the Suez Canal and then around uh, Africa. Uh, and that, uh, depending on the speed of the ships moving, and they do move uh, somewhere between 10 and 14 knots, uh, you could have anywhere from between uh, uh, 10 days to two, two weeks, even a little longer. Uh, the second is capacity constraints on the Suez Canal itself. Uh, and uh, to some degree, uh, the, the number of ships that move through is one aspect of it. They're also the size of the ships that move through. Uh, the Suez Max uh, tanker size is so-called because it's the maximum size tanker you can move through the Suez Canal. Uh, and obviously the, the limitations in, in fleet capacity can, can introduce uh, additional pinch on supply. Right now, uh, crude traded on the NYMEX is up 2.3%. Is this sort of uh, appropriate in your view? Do you think that we should see an even bigger pop in oil prices just simply because of the supply constraints that could come from prolonged uh, shipping passages? Well, yeah, we thought it was significant when we wrote about it a week ago, and we noted how odd it was that the market wasn't yet pricing it in. Uh, as for the, the magnitude of the increase to, to date, uh, I mean, obviously, the numbers I gave you would be staggering if that amount of supply was disabled. Uh, we would see double-digit moves in the oil price on a dollar-per-barrel basis. But uh, a lot of this depends on really the decisions that actors make, and there's a lot of players in this. Uh, questions about whether or not the Saudis, for example, will continue to ship through the Red Sea uh, and whether or not they believe they're at risk of, of attacks. The, uh, the risk tolerances of other players, and for that matter, the evolution of the task force that the U.S. government is working right now actively to stand up with other players in the region, emulating a similar task force in the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, last variable, uh, not to make this more complicated, is the question whether or not the Eisenhower uh, Carrier Strike Group, which moved into position potentially to strike the Houthis, uh, risks a different kind of escalation that could produce reprisals in other parts of the region. Given all of those variables, what's the appropriate price for oil? Well, it, we thought we saw pressure to the upside a week ago. We're seeing it now. We think there's room for more. At this point, what kind of response would be de-escalatory versus escalatory, right? There's this, uh, uh, this group that you said is trying to come together to come up with a way to deter Houthi militants. What are you looking for as a response that could relieve some of the pressure on oil versus the opposite? Well, it really depends on the, the root cause of the problem here. The Houthis seem to be doing something that's fundamentally and conceptually similar to U.S. secondary sanctions. Initially, they started targeting anything with nexus to Israel, Israeli ownership or uh, management of the shipping uh, company or the tanker, uh, or for that matter, just cargoes going into or out of Israel. They've cast the net even more broadly now. 
uh, a stand down, some sort of accommodation that they have a narrower focus. Uh, that kind of thing might potentially take some pressure off. Uh, the, the maritime uh, task force, uh, to the degree that it can provide security for tankers in the region, might not eliminate the risk premium, but it could potentially keep it from rising. At this point, a lot of people are discounting a lot of the geopolitics, simply saying the U.S. Is pumping record amounts of shale. Gasoline prices, on average, in the United States are basically $3 on average. And you can see that uh, across the nation. How much does U.S. production offset a lot of the potential geopolitical headwinds uh, that could cause prices to rise? Well, so there's there's two things that are really offsetting. And one is, of course, the prolific production here uh, in Guyana and on Brazil. Uh, you're seeing non-OPEC production surging, and that has buffered, uh, buffered prices. Uh, and, and of course, we can't overlook demand weakness in China. But the other side of that is that the, the supply cushion that you get from spare capacity from, from OPEC producers is usually something else that can come to the rescue. But in this case, that supply cushion is less available because uh, part of that supply could potentially come out through some of the very same choke points that we're discussing today. So for, th for that reason, I think we, we may see uh, more, more risk uh, showing up in, in price perceptions as we go forward. But yeah, we've been sleeping through some very serious potential supply risks for some time, uh, very reassured by production. Well, this is a reason why uh, some people are wondering, what did they get wrong? How much do you think is that the demand side is offset by the increase in electric vehicle use and other alternative uh, sources of energy? Well, so every million electric vehicles on U.S. roads where we drive more with less efficient cars than other parts of the world is only about 30,000 barrels per day of demand destruction. So we're selling more than a million a year. That's not, not really showing up that much. We see the bigger numbers posting in, in China, uh, and now you're getting bigger displacements. But still, that's not changing the demand picture. Demand is going ahead, at least in the near term. Uh, there are a lot of folks who would say that maybe the, the predictions of a plateau or even a peak uh, this, this decade are even premature. Uh, so with that in mind, I think we shouldn't discount that there's immense appetite for crude oil out there still and, uh, and liquids generally. And with that, supply risks still very much matter. To put this all together, people have been talking about ranges heading into 2024, uh, ranges that oil could move within, given the need to both uh, not lose money on product producing oil in the U.S. and also the desire for Saudi Arabia to make a certain amount per barrel. What is that range, given the risks and given the supplies that we've seen from the U.S.? Well, the the... The idea that there's sort of a natural eight-handle floor established by fiscal break-evens or other mathematical computations uh, has a little bit, you know, of, of I think, hopefulness to it. Uh, there's two active wars going on right now in energy producing and consuming areas uh, with risks potentially in Venezuela uh, as well, although they currently seem to have abated. Uh, with that in mind, I think it's, it's a bit odd to look only at supply-demand balances and assume that the world as it is today will be how it is in the coming year. But if you do look at that, you see supply outstripping demand in the first half of the year. Our, our latest look, my colleague Jacques Rousseau looked ahead at it, uh, and it looks like there's, there's still weakness. And with OPEC plus clamping down, the incremental clap, clamp down isn't necessarily enough to, to stem it in the near term. But this is where geopolitics comes in. And always, uh, it's important to remember, there's an alignment of incentives here uh, for Iran and for the, the other Folks who are aligned with Iran, the idea of a higher oil price because of geopolitical risk isn't a bad thing. It's a tailwind. Kevin Book of Clearview Energy, thank you so much for being with us. At a time where oil prices are uh, finally hitting a lift after a number of weeks, more than a month of losses, given the fact that people have seen the production from the U.S. offset some of the concerns from supply cuts and uh, some of the other potential disruptions. Right now, what you are seeing in markets is a lift. Maybe week eight of a rally that has been the longest going back to 2017, gaining some steam up about a third of a percent, uh, 47.83 as people parse through uh, the economic data and see a soft landing. We are hearing pushback from Fed officials, including Chicago's Austin Coolsby, once again saying, I think the market got a little over its skis. Relax. Market's not really buying it. It's maybe around the edges. Coming up on Bloomberg TV at 1 p.m., BlackRock's Rick Reader from New York. This is Bloomberg.